Yes, as everyone, I am Gregory Contos of Greek Ancestry, and I warmly welcome you to the second International Greek Ancestry Conference, sponsored by Greek Ancestry and the Hellenic Genealogy Geek. The first conference was held in January 2021 and was very successful with many thousands of views. This year we aim higher, not only with attendance, but also with content. This year's conference covers various new topics and introduces fresh ideas. Renowned historians, professional and amateur genealogists and archivists have joined us in this two-day celebration of Greek genealogy and family history. Before I turn this over to you, Georgia, I would like to thank Carol Kostakos Petranik, who labored intensively for the organization of this conference, as well as Gary Petranik, who is making sure that the conference will move smoothly tech-wise. Good luck, okay. <laughs> All right, I am very excited to be participating in this second International Greek Ancestry Conference with Gregory. Working with him is a joy. Um, this conference gives everyone an opportunity to learn about some very interesting historical records, hear about projects that other members are working on, and from professionals that can offer historical and cultural perspectives. I hope you all enjoy the presentations. So now let's just take a minute to review the presentations for today. We're going to open with an interview with author Nicholas Gage. Following that, Carol Kostakis Petranik will um, present Finding Your Ancestors' Original Surname and Village of Origin. Then Dr. Alexander Kitroff will present the Greek diaspora in Egypt. I will then present Hellenic Genealogy Geek, a new website and resources. Linda Carroll Trotter will speak about the FDGIA project, search, reunion, advocacy, and education. Sophia Pizzinelli will present Heroes Till the End, The Last Moments of Greek Fighters. Yanis Mikalakakos will present Life in Early 20th Century Greece. And we will end the day with questions and answers with Gregory. So there we go, take it away, Greg. Thank you, Georgia. You're welcome. <laughs> Nick, great. Hi, Nick. Hi, Greg. Thank you for being with us today. My pleasure. Let me briefly introduce you to our audience, if it's needed, and then we can start with the interview. Okay. In his long career as journalist, author, and producer, Nicholas Gage has spent the first half as an investigative reporter and foreign correspondent in the second, writing seven books and producing several films, one of which was nominated for an Academy Award as Best Picture. He was nominated for the Pulitzer Prize six times and received numerous awards for his reporting. His books include Greek Fire, A Place for Us, and Eleni, his account of his mother's life and death during the Greek Civil War. Translated into 32 languages, it received the top literary prize of 1984 from the Royal Society of Literature of Great Britain. Gage's next book, A Place for Us, was widely praised as a moving saga of the immigrant experience. His most recent work, Greek Fire, is a dual biography of Maria Callas and Aristotle Onassis. In between writing books, he has worked in motion pictures and has received five honorary degrees, including a doctorate in 1985 from Boston University. Mr. Gage, who established a scholarship fund at Boston University in memory of his mother, has been active in a number of philanthropic and human rights organizations, for which he has raised several million dollars and is an archon of the ecumenical patriarchate. Nick, I will start with your book, Eleni, published in 1983. In 1947, during the Greek Civil War, Eleni, your mother, was arrested and executed by communist fighters for trying to save you and your siblings from ending up in a communist country as the fighters were taking children with them on their retreat. Some choose to forget traumatic experiences. Others choose to remember. You clearly belong to the second group. At what point in life 
did you decide to explore your family history and to make your family's experience public? Uh, in the seventh grade, when an English teacher that I had um, noticed that I had some ability to uh, write and uh, mentored me and uh, started me on a career as a journalist and a writer, that gave me the uh, means to be able to research and tell uh, uh, what happened to my family and particularly to my mother during the Greek Civil War. And um, I determined then at the age of 13, I think I was 14, um, to go back and uh, find uh, out uh, all the details of, uh, um, of the, my mother's uh, trial and execution. And, um, uh, but I knew that until then I had to develop the skills. Um, so I, I became a, a reporter, I went to, uh, uh, for the local paper in Worcester, Massachusetts, where I grew up. Then I went to study uh, journalism at Boston University. And then um, uh, I won a scholarship to uh, the, the Columbia University Graduate School of Journalism. And um, I began a career with the Associated Press, but I quickly turned to uh, investigative reporting to develop the skills to root out the story of uh, uh, my own family. And I became an investigative reporter for uh, the Boston Herald Traveler and then the Wall Street Journal. And finally at the age of 30, I was the chief investigative reporter for the New York Times. And um, I did very well there in, in um, exposés. I had the first uh, uh, tape in the Watergate story uh, uh, I had uh, um, I had the first big expose of Spiro Agnew I uh, 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 I covered the mafia wars I went all through Latin America to uh, detail the uh, drug trade there and uh, the um, I did so well that the executive editor called me in and said anything you want in the paper uh, within reason, I said, I want to uh, be the bureau chief in uh, Greek, in Athens. He said, we don't have a bureau in Athens. I said, start one. And uh, he did. Uh, he, he said he would if I gave him three more years in the States. Uh, I agreed. And um, uh, they sent Steve Roberts and Koki Roberts to Athens to open the bureau. And three years later, I replaced them and began the search of my mother's story, which um, uh, uh, was very difficult at the beginning because I had so much to cover. I covered all of the countries between uh, Greece and Iran. I covered the Iranian revolution. I had the first interview with the Shah, uh, the last interview with the Shah, the first with Khomeini. Um, and I covered uh, uh, civil wars and uh, Lebanon, uprisings in Turkey. And um, so I, I knew if I was gonna really focus on my mother's story, I had to leave the times. And uh, I, uh, I did uh, and focused on, on, on the story. Um, I, I tracked down uh, everyone who was still alive that was in my village when my mother was arrested, uh, tortured, tried in you know, bogus, uh, uh, show trial and then executed. And uh, I went all over Eastern Europe. I had more than 300 interviews. And I went back and wrote the story. And uh, I thought it would sell 5,000 copies to uh, Greek Americans. I basically wrote it for my nephews and nieces and for my own children so that they would know uh, the price that was paid for the kind of life they were leading. And uh, but the book took off. It uh, it was uh, serialized in many magazines. We had seventy movie offers from everyone and uh, uh, all the studios, and um, it it moved on. Um, and uh, uh, I uh, I didn't go back to the times. I continued uh, 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 writing books and making films. 
So what it is, what does it mean for you to, to, to make this, this story public? Does it mean um, justice? Is it the truth? Um, is it the, the, your version of history that drives you? Well, it's not my version. It's, uh, I'm, a, I'm a, a reporter. I've always been a reporter. And it's the facts that drive me. I, I wrote a book uh, that uh, all, uh, all the names were real. All the dates were uh, real. All the places were real. Uh, people tried to find errors in my book. Uh, uh, the book was serialized by uh, the German magazine um, uh, Stern. Uh, they sent five reporters to Greece to track to talk to people I had talked to to try to find mistakes in the book. Uh, none of them appeared. Uh, uh, I think uh, the answer to the question is uh, the, the the last line uh, of a review by C. M. Woodhouse, the British historian, who said uh, Helen is one of the rare books in which the uh, power of art recreates the full historical truth. Understanding what happened and revealing all this information, discovering it. How, what was it like for you to be back to Greece and in the place where all that happened? Well, you know, my, when we, before we left the village, my mother, told me to throw a black stone. That was a, 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 term, a term, a term, Rixe Mavri Petra, uh, that uh, was used in those days, uh, not to come back because of the pain and um, that uh, our family and all the people living in those villages went through. And uh, it's the one uh, request of my mother that I, I, I didn't follow fully. And there are two reasons for this. Uh, one, Greece is so beautiful uh, as a country. Uh, uh, it just, uh, it's, it's uh, I've, never, I've been all over the world as a reporter. I never found any places that were dramatically beautiful as Greece. And also, despite the, the horrors that we experience in, in the hands of fellow Greeks, uh, I think that I, I, I admire greatly the Greek people, their vision, their endurance, um, their uh, ability to uh, uh, survive through centuries of occupation where they were re uh, reduced to abject serfs by the Turks, uh, their, uh, their daring. You have to understand who we are, uh, every, um, every civilization before the Greeks were tyrannies. Uh, they, were, they were ruled by despots, by kings, emperors. Why was that? Because when people began to form communities in uh, prehistoric times, they, they knew that they had to have water. And the way that they, the only way that they thought order could be achieved through what was through a strong leader. The Greeks were the first to dare to believe that you could have order and freedom. And they, they produced democracy. And that is the values they produce are the values in, word, in which the whole world functions today. So um, when one talks about uh, preserving uh, our, uh, our heritage, my God, you know, uh, who has a heritage like us and why wouldn't anybody fortunate enough to be uh, born to that history uh, not uh, want to uh, uh, know as much about it as possible to um, uh, know about their connections to it as possible. Um, so while you were doing your research, what, how difficult was it? Well, it, um, you know, uh, uh, because I had the training uh, to, uh, uh, as a reporter, I, uh, um, 
uh, it, it, uh, I was very successful because, um, for example, most of the people from my village were scattered behind the uh, uh, Iron Curtain. Um, I was doing my uh, my research in the uh, early 1980s, um, and uh, uh, most of this country, uh, most of our people were in in uh, in um, Poland, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, Russia. And uh, so I knew, for example, from, uh, from covering the mafia that uh, uh, you, the, the way uh, uh, to, uh, to get into um, a, a story is to find uh, uh, common interests with uh, the people. So I would, for example, approach uh, communist leaders and uh, that were in the village at the time, and I would say I'm writing a book about the Greek Civil War in in uh, the Murgana Mountains, and uh, they felt that because I went to talk to them that I must be writing the kind of propaganda books that they were used to um, promoting their uh, uh, point of view. Uh, I didn't, they, so they never asked me uh, what is the book about? And I just asked them about the, the events that happened in the village. And uh, uh, they told me about the crime, you know, the killings and so forth, but they blamed other, others for it. Uh, and um, so by, by uh, cross-checking uh, 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 the events, for example, if, if someone in, in Grozno, Poland, told me about uh, some uh, an event they witnessed, and someone in Tashkent, Russia, told me about the same event, and uh, and uh, 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 then I knew it was true. This was a basic rule of investigative reporting. You needed two independent sources that that uh, did not communicate with each other to tell you the same thing, and uh, so. Uh, I use those techniques that I use as a reporter, and I was able to collect information. That's why nobody uh, has ever sued me in Greece. Uh, uh, nobody has ever uh, uh, come up with any uh, mistakes or misrepresentations in my book. Uh, uh, every name, every detail is true. Did you have many uh, surviving relatives back in the in La when no, you visited? Uh, no, uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, many years have passed, and most of uh, people have died, including three of my four sisters. I see. Uh, okay, um, moving to your second book, A Place for Us. Right. It was published in 1989 and narrates your family's immigrant experience in the city of Worcester, Massachusetts in the 1950s. Mm -hmm. um, can, you, can, you talk us to, can you talk to us about that experience? Well, um, that was kind of the, the high point of uh, uh, Greek immigrant culture, I think, in the 50s, uh, because uh, uh, those that had come in the first half of the century uh, was still tied to their Greek traditions so that their children who were first generation uh, may have been born in the, in the States, but uh, they spoke Greek, they learned Greek at home, they observed the holidays, they were, they were active in the church. <clears throat> and, uh, and then there were new immigrants like me and my sisters who uh, came right after the World War II and, and replenish those communities. So the, the Greek identity in those communities uh, was very strong. Um, and it was an ideal opportunity to establish institutions that would preserve that identity. But um, uh, unfortunately that wasn't done. Um, for example, uh, uh, what should have been uh, set up were uh, by uh, private schools that uh, taught Greek, um, that uh, 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 you know studied the classics, that were as good as the top private schools 
of uh, the uh, uh, Episcopalians and the French and the Italians. And uh, this wasn't done. There was an attempt to set up a university, uh, the Hellenic College, but you know, you can't create a notion if you don't have rivers, you know? And so they weren't the secondary schools to supply the university and it, it faded. Um, so uh, I think a lot, there were a lot of missed opportunities, um, but uh, I think with the, the development of uh, the new technology such as this, uh, you know, I think people who feel their Greekness uh, communicate with each other through the internet, through Facebook, through many uh, social media, and um, a sense of identity uh, is still maintained. But frankly, we're losing, you know, the, most of uh, our young people uh, have no sense of, uh, of uh, their uh, Greek heritage. And um, it's, it's sad because there is no greater. I mean, think about it. Three of the four greatest dramatists uh, were Greek. <laughs> the only non-Greek was Shakespeare. I mean, Aeschylus, Sophocles, uh, Euripides, uh, the greatest philosophers, the greatest sculptors, the, the you know, the, uh, the greatest poets. Uh, uh, and um, no uh, few other cultures are as rich as ours. And it's a shame that uh, uh, people are dismissing it uh, from their lives uh, um, because uh, it can enrich their lives tremendously. Yeah. I, I should note that with uh, uh, family history and genealogy, there are some uh, young people that start to get interested, which is uh, good news. Yeah. Yeah, that is. Uh, but, let me, sorry. Uh, so when you were growing up in Worcester, um, so you come from Epiros, mm -hmm. were there many Epirotes in Worcester? Oh yeah, the, it was, it's one of, that's where the Panepirotic Federation of America was, was founded. It, it was, it's uh, one of the main uh, centers of uh, Epirot settlements. You know? uh, so I found many relatives, from uh, from um, uh, from nearby villages, uh, from our area, uh, from the Morgana Mountains, my father brought over about a hundred relatives, and I uh, uh, he would uh, I would file the applications, and he would sign them, and they would come uh, in droves, cousins uh, uh, and uh, nephews, nieces. Wow. Uh, uh, a little Epiros in Massachusetts. Yeah, it was. It was. Um, so do you think that that helped you integrate? Um, or did it um, create like a, a more uh, uh, secluded, you know, Greek community that is not very uh, much in contact with the American? No, the, see, the, the thing about... Uh, about America is that it's so free, so open, so inviting. Uh, so they offer so many opportunities that it's it's irresistible and you're drawn into it. So to me, there's no worry about being secluded and isolated in a Greek community. That happened in in uh, in in countries where uh, the uh, general environment was hostile, like in Egypt, in Turkey, and other places. But in the United States, the, the, the draw, the pull of the, of the local uh, uh, culture is overwhelming. So the struggle is how do you re to retain your uh, uh, Greek identity, not uh, how to assimilate. <laughs> assimilate is uh, an irresistible force in America, assimilation. <laughs> So how do you how do you perceive um, the modern Greek American identity um, as opposed to when you were growing up? What do you think that has changed? Well, uh, a lot of people have have abandoned their 
the Greek. Uh, when I was growing up, for example, uh, there were um, university clubs, the Hellenic university clubs, uh, 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 gatherings of young people. They intermarried. And uh, now uh, uh, they don't exist anymore. And I'm, I think the one in 10 Greeks uh, you know, marries another Greek, you know, these days. Uh, um, so um, all those uh, uh, institutions that kept you connected to your Greek heritage, they have uh, either disappeared or greatly weakened and uh, are barely not existing. But has the notion of Greekness, has it changed? Well, um, um, <laughs> it depends on what Greekness, you know, you're, you're talking, there are two uh, Greeks, the, the, uh, as Patrick Lee Firmer said, there's the, the Hellenic Greek and uh, Oromios, you know, the, the Byzantine Greek. Um, and uh, I think there's a, the, the pride in the Hellenic uh, Greek uh, is still strong. The traditions of the of the Byzantine uh, Greek um, uh, are fading fast. Yeah. Do you? There are still some some Greeks new new arrivals to the U.S. Um, do you think they are? They, they realize what you say about the importance of Greekness and the need to preserve it? Or do you think that they are um, more than willing to, to rapidly assimilate? Yeah, they, they, they are able to rapidly assimilate. For example, when I came, I had to learn the language. I didn't know a word of English when I arrived. Most of those who come now know English already and they you know, they, they, uh, uh, they get jobs, they, uh, they join organizations, uh, they're, they're able to uh, uh, jump in uh, uh, wholeheartedly. Uh, so, um, and uh, they rarely, for example, uh, we have ten, in Worcester, we have 10 colleges and universities and the number of students from Greece in those colleges and universities. I rarely see any of them in, in church, you know, um, or in any, joining any of our organizations. It's not a pretty picture, but I hope technology uh, strengthens the, the, the bonds, you know. I can't hear you now, I can't hear you. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, I was saying when I remember when I came to the States, I was second grade of high school. And mm. although I never uh, went to church when I was in Greece, in the States, I felt that it was very different. Like the church itself, it was different. Not, I mean, it meant something else. It wasn't the, it, it was more about Greek, Greekness and uh, it symbolized something Something unique. Yeah, I think I think uh, that it's very difficult to maintain. The, the church is the Greek community in in America, and I think it's very hard to maintain a Greek identity uh, if you uh, don't involve yourself in in the, in the local church. And um, uh, and um, uh, unfortunately, the churches don't reach out to new arrivals. Uh, to the to the colleges to uh, uh, to the universities uh, to bring these young people you know into the communities uh, because they feel you know they'll graduate and they'll leave you know it's yeah. not the thing you know uh, um, it's uh, uh, I think uh, effort is is needed from both the communities and from the individual students. Yeah, it's maybe it's something like a, a gap between the old Greek immigrant community and the new one. The there is no old. The old is dead. I mean, yeah. I, I, how many uh, Greek-born um, uh, uh, people do you know uh, 
in, in, in my community, for example, in my church, uh, I think maybe 5% were born in Greece, you know. So, uh, uh, and, and, and they're not coming in in, in great numbers uh, because uh, uh, of the European Union, because uh, uh, Greece is in the European Union, um, they can go anywhere in Europe to work and be close to Greece and, uh, and find equal opportunities in Europe. So they go to Europe, they don't come here. Yeah, yeah. Okay, um, last question. How important do you think that family history research and genealogy is for the preservation of Greekness and Greek history? I, I think it's, it's crucial to um, strengthen the identity. Uh, uh, if you care about where you, where you came from, uh, where your people came from, and you research uh, the struggles that people went through to maintain their Greek identity. Epirus, for example, was not liberated from the Turks until 1913, Macedonia as well, in Thrace. Um, my father, passport says, born in Turkey, you know, uh, and he told me uh, that his greatest... Uh, 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 moment in his life was when he got on a sh ship uh, in Patras um, to sail for America and he, throw, he threw the fez that he had been wearing in Epirus into the sea, you know. Um, uh, I think uh, it's important um, because for centuries uh, people that uh, <clears throat> struggled, suffered uh, 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 to maintain their identity and for us to uh, treat it casually and to uh, dismiss it uh, my, and my god what an, what a heritage you know why would anybody want to do it but um, unfortunately uh, um, a large number of uh, people uh, you know uh, don't um, want to uh, uh, take the time to find out where they came from, and they lose a lot. They lose. They. Uh, it's very uh, important to know who you are, and uh, to have a clear identity. Uh, and it it strengthens your character. It strengthens your sanity. <laughs> it uh, strength. It strengthens your purpose and your values. Um, and I I think it's crucial, and it's enriched my life and the lives of my children, hopefully my grandchildren as well. Um, but um, uh, so uh, uh, mm -hmm. it's a shame that not more Greeks uh, are not uh, searching, uh, uh, researching their uh, heritage, but uh, uh, I think they, uh, they would find a, a very valuable uh, treasure if they do. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, as Greek ancestry, I can tell you that it's mostly uh, Greek Americans, Greek Canadians, Greek Australians who are interested, uh, especially older people, and maybe one out of 20 or one out of 30 of the clients uh, are from Greece, like living in Greece, mm -hmm. yeah. which is also uh, shameful. Yeah, I don't know, shameful, I mean... We live yeah, in a, I, I mean, it's a pity. Everybody has a, uh, a choice to do what they want, but it, it's sad because, and it's uh, it, it's uh, because uh, they are losing a lot. They're yeah. losing a lot. Have you made your family tree? Uh, my family tree? Uh, yeah, pretty much. Yeah. In okay. fact, I have it, I have it in my, the walls of my house. Okay. In, in pictures. <laughs> how, how far back? were you able to go? Uh, 1857. Okay, that's, for Epiros, that's good. That's good, yeah. Yeah, very little uh, archival material has been preserved. Yeah. Yeah, 1857 is the uh, farthest back. Okay. 
I have no more questions to, to ask. Well, I have many, <laughs> but we, we have to move to the next presentation. It, okay. was, a, it was a great honor to, to have you here. My pleasure. And I wish everyone well. And Kali Hronia, Yea, Ke Kares. Kali Hronia to you too. Thank you. Bye. Bye. We will now move to uh, the presentation by Carol Kostakos Petranik. Greg. Hey. Hi, Carol. What? That was so fabulous to listen to Nicholas Gage. He is an amazing presenter. Oh my gosh. What, what, an, what a, just what a story. And yeah. I just love that he, he took a real tragedy in his own life and made it into an educational experience for people worldwide to truly understand some of the horrors that that occurred not only to his family but to so many families and not only in that time frame but throughout Greece's history this unfortunately has just been um, a really sad uh, a really sad moment in Greek history so I am ready to start well let, let me introduce you first Don't oh worry. okay you can introduce me I'll let you <laughs> so uh, for those of you who do not know Carol, uh, she serves as an assistant director of the Washington, D.C. Family History Center, where she coordinates classes, conferences, and community outreach projects. An active member of the Greek genealogy community, she shares her knowledge by participating in Greek online associations, writing articles, and teaching at local and national conferences like this one. Her ancestors are from several Sp Spartan villages, including Ayus Ioannis and Amikles. Her passion for Greek family history has prompted her to volunteer to preserve at-risk and historic records in Greece, beginning with the digitization of marriage records at the metropolis of Sparta. She is affiliated with Family Search on several initiatives and with GreekAncestry.net on record acquisitions in Greece. Carol blogs about her Greek research at Spartan Roots in Ayus Ioannis, Sparta. She also writes personal and family histories and is a volunteer at the National Archives in Washington, D.C. Guys, let me tell you that this is a very modest bio that Carol provided. <laughs> um, thank you, Greg. <laughs> thank you for being with us today and helping with the conference. The floor is yours. All right, wonderful. You can start. Okay, I will start. Welcome, everybody. I am really so excited to be with you today. And thanks, Greg, for such a wonderful partnership. We've worked together on a lot of things over the years, and I hope it'll continue way into the future. So in this session, I am going to present information to help you find your family's original surname and your family's village of or origin. So I am talking from personal experience because I've been researching my family for many, many years. And I have learned sometimes the hard way how important it is to have this specific information because without it, you cannot begin to research your family in Greek records. First, you have to know the unaltered original surname of your family. So when you look at this chart, I'll give you, I gave you a couple of examples. Immigrants often shorten their names by either cutting off the ending or cutting off the beginning. Or they took an English name that was a translation of their Greek name. For example, Diamantis could have been anglicized to diamond. So um, think about this as you look at the names that are in your family which ones could have been shortened. If you have a Pappas or a Poulos, trust me, it's a redacted name. So you need to dig in and find out what that real name is. If you have a name like Diamond or something that translates from a Greek word, then you at least have a hint 
of what that original name could have possibly been. The second thing is you absolutely have to know the exact village that your family came from. My family, three of my four grandparents are from Iosiwani, Sparta. There are over 18 villages just in the Peloponnese that have the name Iosiwani's. So I need to know that my family came from Iosiwani, Sparta, not Iosiwani, Achaia, or something like that. So original village and the region in Greece where that village is located. Why these two items are first, remember Greek records are written with the surname that the village had, that the family had in the village and each village kept its own records. Remember that the country of Greece itself does not have a database where you can go in and type a name. You can do it now on Greek ancestry and you can also do it on MyHeritage which is um, the only other website, major website, that has any Greek records online that are searchable by name, both in Greek and in English. But if you go into Greece itself, or you look on, the, on a website for Greece to try to find such a database, there isn't one. Last year, Georgia Stryker Kielman and I put our heads together and we came up with two charts to help you. This chart here is a chart for where you can find specific record information in your ancestors' new country that may give you the original surname and village. This chart shows you excuse me just a second. They're telling me that my screen isn't sharing. Okay, let's start from here. Okay, I'm sharing now. Um, sorry, I apologize. I didn't realize I've gone through six slides and I did not realize that I wasn't screen sharing. Um, okay, so let's just pick up from here. So this particular chart shows you in your, your ancestor's new country, his new homeland, where you can begin to look for specific records. And that, I, what I need you to do and what you're gonna have to do is look at every one of these record collections in order to make sure that you have the correct information. This chart that Georgia and I created shows you which types of records in Greece, in the Greek records, can provide information that you are looking for. So look at both of these. They're going to be downloadable on the Greek Ancestry website. And after the conference, print them out, save a, a soft copy on your computer, because these are going to be your two guidelines to help you find your original surname and village of origin. Another place to get started is the Family Search Wiki. Now, Family Search is a free genealogy website and it has an extensive wiki. A wiki is not where you go look for names. A wiki is where you go look for information. So on the Family Search Wiki, whatever country your ancestor emigrated to, be sure you go to that wiki page on Family Search and start um, looking around, it will give you information about the country itself. It will give you links that are online um, that can help you find the records you need in your uh, ancestors' new country. Okay, let's start with the very first and very important vital records, birth, marriages, and deaths. Always, always, always begin with primary sources, which are these vital records. I cannot tell you how many times people come into the National Archives and they want to try to find information on, on a particular family member. And the first thing I say to them is, what's on the birth record? What's on the marriage record? What's on the death record? And they say to me, well, I don't have that. I just want to find this person in, in whatever, a passenger ship or something. No, 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 you don't do that. You have to get the birth, marriage and death records first. They were created at the time of event and they are your primary sources. Here's a birth record for my dad. 
Now, note the corrections that were made. Originally, his name was written as Costas, then it was corrected to Costacos. Notice the maiden name of the mother is written on this record, um, Hariclia Arida. The place of birth for both parents is just Greece, not the village, but still with this American birth record, I do have a maiden name for my grandmother. This is a Greek Orthodox baptism record from Australia. It gives the names of the parents and their villages. So the father is Dimitrios Vragalis, born in Neocastro, and the mother of the child is Paraskevi. Now, unfortunately, it doesn't give us her surname, but it does give us her village of Lekuri Elasona. So we are off to a good start with this record, and I want to thank um, my friend Nick Fragalis for sharing it with us. For marriage records, there are three different types. There's a license that's issued by the state. There's the official marriage certificate issued by the state and the church marriage certificate. Now, civil and church marriages have different information. So you have to find them both. If you find a civil record, that's fine. If you find a church record, that's better, but find them both and I'll show you why. This is a civil marriage record for my maternal grandparents. It does not give the name of the village. It only says Greece. And you can see um, on the left where I've extracted the information that it does give us information about the bride and about the groom. Now, look in red at the date. The date says the 10th of May, 1914. This is the same couple's marriage certificate from Holy Trinity Church in New York City. Now it gives different information. It gives both the bride and groom's father's names, but not their mother's names. However, it does give us the village names, which were not in the civil record. Iosiwani, Sparta, and Mistras. So by taking the two records together and combining them, I am getting a much fuller picture of the information that I need. Now, the other interesting thing is look at the date that's in red. It says 27 10 April 1914. So why does the civil record have May and the church record have April? The discrepancy is the church was still following the Julian calendar. So it gave the 27th of April as the Julian date, but it also reflected the date of the 10th, which is in May. Now, um, this is important information. You should record both dates in your genealogy database. For death records, there are a lot of places to look. Um, and some of them are listed here and they are listed on the handout that you'll have. But I want you to look closely at this tombstone. This is in Mount Olivet Cemetery in New York. Even though my grandfather changed his name to Pappas, the family put Papayanakos on the tombstone. So if I was kind of coming up with some blank um, searches, just going and finding the tombstone and, and looking at it may give you the original surname. Also, some cemeteries, um, the surname is written in Greek, and that's very important too. Here's my grandfather's civil death record. This record is accurate for the death information, which was given by the doctor who certified the death. But all the other information that's in that red box was given by an informant. In this case, the informant was my uncle, my grandfather's son. He got some of the information wrong, particularly his um, grandfather, his, his grandmother's name, my grandfather's uh, mother. Um, so be careful, beware, um, make sure that the information that you're looking at, who was the informant and is it the primary source for that event? That event here is the death, so the information about the death is correct. Everything else given by an informant is susceptible to error. If you know where your ancestor attended church, call and ask the secretary if you can look at the death records to find your ancestor's death record or if the secretary would be willing to do that. This record is from Three Hierarchs Church in Brooklyn. 
It's a good source for the name as it's written in Greek, but the exact village is not given. Here it says Sparta, not Ios Ioannis. We already talked about the actual tombstones in the cemetery, but I wanna point out that some in some communities, people have compiled information about those that died, um, the Greeks that died in their areas. A lot of larger cities have Greeks sections in their cemeteries. So be sure to find out, and you can ask at the church, has anybody compiled um, a record of who is buried in the Greek cemeteries? Let me show you why this is so important. Here's a page from Nick, excuse me, from Nicholas's book, Nicholas Previs, who compiled the book on Woodlawn Cemetery in Baltimore, Maryland. Look at all the name changes. This is why it's so hard to find your people in the records. On the right side is listed the ancestral village. And on the left side is the name of the person as they were shown in the cemetery records and in the church records. This book is an absolute gold mine. And I hope, I hope that there is something similar in your area to help you. The second group of records to look at is immigration and naturalization. When your ancestor came to his new country, the paperwork which followed him is very important to find. Passenger ship records, we all know about them. They're the first thing that people look for. Now, depending on the country, they can be found in archives or in genealogy databases like MyHeritage or Ancestry. And right here and now, I want to correct a myth. Please do not perpetuate the myth that names were changed at Ellis Island or some other, uh, some other port of entry. That is absolutely, totally false. And it leads people to misinformation. What happens is when, that, when your ancestor boarded that ship, he gave his name, he or she, and he or she answered specific questions. That record, what was written down with his name was given to the ship captain. The ship, the ship captain took it with him on the ship across the sea, and it was handed to the individual um, who uh, collected the records for that particular ship. Each passenger had to answer the same questions in his new country that he answered when he embarked on the ship. And he was checked off on that manifest, literally checked off. So if he said his name was Tom Jones when he got on the ship in Piraeus, then on the other side, his name was Tom Jones on that manifest. It's not that somebody changed his name, that's the name he gave. Here's an example of some of the questions that are asked on some of the little later manifests, later, meaning later than 1905, 1906. As you can see, there are two questions asked, which will help you find the original surname and village, um, the name and address of the relative and the country he came from and his or her place of birth. This is an immigration record from the National Archives of Australia. It's filled with the exact information that you're seeking, father's name, mother's name, date, and place of birth. This is a 26-page file, and it includes detailed medical information about the informant. So if you have family in Australia, you have a gold mine here. And again, I want to thank my friend Nick Regalis for sharing this document with us. If you're in the US and you cannot find your ancestor in Ellis Island or other passenger ship records, consider that he or she crossed from Canada into the US. In this example, we see that Ekaterini Ladis um, said that she was born in Sparta. However, her brother is Demos Zacharopoulos in Ios Ioannis. So I would tend to um, have a pretty strong guess that she was also from Ios Ioannis, and we now have her maiden name, Zacharopoulos. If your ancestor emigrated to Canada, the Library and Archives of Canada is a fabulous resource. It has so many digitized records online 
that will help you, immigration, citizenship, and naturalization. They also have a detailed section about Greek genealogy and history, which really surprised me. This is a manifest for the Port of Quebec City from 1865 to 1922. On line 24 of that manifest, we see that Constantine Papadopoulos, age 28, arrived in August 1909, and he was headed for Quebec. For his um, place of birth, it just says Greece, but there could be other records, hopefully for your ancestors, that do give the exact village. So last, I want to show you some other records that you should never, ever overlook in your search. The first is a census record. Even though a census record is not helpful for finding the village, it will show you an entire family, their ages, their occupations, and other data. Plus, you can place that family in a specific time. In this case, this census record is from Kingston, Ohio in 1921. I want you to look for any will or probate files in the country where your ancestor immigrated into. Will and probate records are very rich resources. Most people look for a will, but they don't think to ask for the probate file. So the will is written by the person who gives specific people money or objects. The probate records are created by the court when the person dies. And those records deal with the distribution of the estate. I have seen with my own eyes probate records, which give the name and addresses of the deceased person's family members in the country where they're living. So if you keep running into Greece, Greece, Greece with no specific village and your ancestor has died in his new homeland, um, in his new homeland, please check the probate files. If he or she left money or property to someone in his home or her home village, that is going to be in the probate files. And last but not all, we cannot forget about family photographs. I always love to see people post their photographs on the Hellenic Genealogy Geek Facebook page and ask for translations. And the community is so wonderful in doing these translations. Ask your older family members if you can look at their pictures and snap a picture of the picture. We've all got our phones now, they've all got cameras. Take a picture of the front and the back. And if you can't read it, then post it on Hellenic Genealogy Geek Facebook page and one of us will. I also want to remind you about military records. Your male immigrant ancestor may have been required to register in his new country, um, especially during war years. So he may have a draft registration and if he served in the military, he would have a military record. Be sure you look for it. You never know, he may have his anglicized name on there, but then again, he may not. You don't know until you actually look at it and obituaries. Many newspapers have been digitized and are now online. Always, always, always check for an obituary. These are written by family members and you never know what they're going to decide to include. In this one, we have the names of Elaine's parents and the fact that they were from Anabriti, Laconia. Okay, well, still no luck. Searching in all the documents we discussed today should give you your ancestor's original surname and village. But if you've hit a brick wall, you may have to repeat that search for all your ancestor's family members. Nobody wants to hear that, but it is true that your grandfather's brother may have a record that your grandfather does not. So in summary, I want you to find as many sources as you can. Each of them have different information and be open to researching your family members, not just your immediate ancestor. And I just want to say, Greg, thanks so much for the opportunity to share this. I, I apologize that my screen share didn't go in the first few slides, but um, I think we have everything that people can use. And be sure everyone to download the handouts from the website. Thanks so much.
Thank you very much, Carol. The handouts will be available uh, most likely tomorrow when the conference is over. So yeah, uh, keep it in mind and uh, please uh, go and download them. They will be very, very helpful. Uh, we will now uh, move to uh, Alexander Getroyev and his presentation. Hi. Hi, Gregory. How are you? Good, very good. Let me briefly introduce you. Okay. And you can start your presentation. Sure. Professor Alexander Kutroyev was born in Athens and educated in the United Kingdom, where he received his, his doctorate degree in modern history from the University of Oxford. He is currently professor of history at Haverford College in Pennsylvania and has taught at several other institutions. His research focuses on identity in Greece and its diaspora in a broad range from politics and sports on which he has published extensively. His most recent books are The Greeks and the Making of Modern Egypt, 2019, and Greek Orthodoxy in America and Modern History, 2020. He is currently working on two book projects, The History of AHEPA, the American Hellenic Educational Progressive Association to mark the organization's centenary in 2022, in the history of Greek owned dinner restaurants in America. And as far as I know, Alexander Kitrev uh, just got back home from um, a trip to Cairo where he was presenting his um, uh, book about Greeks in Egypt. That's right. It was the, um, I was in Cairo at the, for the uh, 53rd international. Uh, uh, book fair, uh, which is held uh, in Egypt's capital, and Greece was the uh, honored guest. And uh, there's a series of panels on Greek books, on um, on uh, Greek books that are translated in Arabic, on the cultural relations between the two uh, countries. And the first panel was about my book on the uh, Greeks in Egypt, which has been translated into Arabic. So it was it was a great occasion, great fun, and 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 helped me warm up for this right. <laughs> presentation, for which I I thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, it's a great uh, pleasure to be participating again. I've got a PowerPoint presentation uh, to take us through what I want to talk about. So I'm going to um, share screen. Yeah. share screen get rid of everything else and get this um, PowerPoint. Yes, it should be. Perfect. Yeah, great. Good. So I'd like to do two things, actually, in this presentation. I want to talk about the history of the Greeks in Egypt, but, but I thought because this is a genealogy event, I, I wanted to talk about the way I learned about my own family history while I was researching the history of the Greeks in Egypt. My father's side of the family uh, are Greeks from Egypt. So I was the first, uh, after, after three generations in Egypt, I was the first to be born in Greece because the Greeks were leaving Egypt in the 1950s because of the uh, nationalist revolution that took place. So. Um, uh, in, in a sense, it's it's my interest is both academic as well as uh, personal. So um, these are the, the this is the um, these are the books I was talking about. At least the two on the right you can see. The first is uh, a, a, a short monograph which was based on my doctoral dissertation that I um, completed at Oxford University in 1984. And this book came out in 1989. And then uh, uh, by that time, I moved to the United States and shifted away from studying the Greeks in Egypt um, and was doing the study, uh, studying the Greek Americans and other things. And then out of the blue of a few years ago, I was invited to write this overview of the history of the Greeks in Egypt. And I was delighted to um, accept. And those, the English book came out and the Arabic translation has been published. And now there's a Greek one in the pipeline. 
Um, the Greeks in Egypt are this, you know, if we take Greek, if we take the last 200 years of Greek history, 1821 to, to uh, today, uh, I think the two most important, biggest and most important diaspora communities are the Greeks in Egypt in the 19th up to the early 20th century, and then it's the Greeks in the United States. So uh, they, they're they well worth studying. And that was, aside from my family roots, this was the other reason to study them, because they were an important um, community. They went to Egypt because of the cotton boom in Egypt. Uh, when, uh, America, when the American Civil War happened and uh, American cotton exports were limited because the North blockaded the ports of the South from where cotton was being exported, uh, a lot of the, the, the slack was taken up by the production of an export of Egyptian cotton, which was very, very high quality. And it was what the British needed for their textile mills in Lancashire. I should note that cotton has not got, cotton uh, cultivation has not got the negative connotations that it has uh, in the history of the United States in the sense that, well, it wasn't much fun working on the f cotton fields in Egypt, but, but this was not slave labor. Uh, it, was, it, it was agricultural workers who were, uh, they were paid low low wages, but there wasn't the stigma and and the dark uh, sh shadow of history that that uh, is on uh, the, the, that we have with the history of cotton in the United States. That does not exist. It's 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 celebrated in in Egypt in many ways because it was uh, an important way that the country entered modernity. Uh, the Greek presence in Egypt, and as I said, they're, they're important in the 19th up to the early um, 20th. Uh, from the 1800s, they're invited to go to Egypt. These are the early Greek merchants. They're invited to go to Egypt to help the country's modernization, and they do so. They've got privileges, like all foreigners. Egypt was part of the Ottoman Empire. Um, and the Ottoman Empire gave privileges to foreign minorities, so the Greeks counted as foreigners in Egypt and had privileges, which meant that they were, um, they were not taxed locally, and they had their own court system, so they didn't have to go to the Egyptian courts. Those two things were very, very important, of course, enabling a lot of commercial activity to go on uh, freely and unencumbered. Um, in 1882, the British uh, take over Egypt. Egypt never becomes a British colony, but it, it's an informal possession of the British because the Egyptian economy had run into foreign debt because of uh, high interest rates and bad uh, local administration. So the British come in and take over directly from 1882 onwards. Um, and uh, are there in uh, 1919, uh, we have the rise of the Egyptian nationalist movement, which is uh, starts in 1919. It starts a bit earlier, but it takes on mass, uh, a mass movement from 1919 onwards, demanding independence, demanding the British go and demanding that foreign privileges are eliminated. And the country goes through a period of gradual Egyptianization with the British gradually uh, loosening their control. And then in 1952 is the revolution in Egypt, the Nasser revolution, which will lead indirectly to the exodus of the Greeks, of most of the Greeks, not all of them. The Greeks are never expelled. But the country's economy, first of all, is nationalized, is, is Egyptianized and then nationalized. So a great deal of the private enterprise the Greeks were engaged in, uh, they were unable to do so anymore. So many of them, most of them decided to leave. And now there are only a few thousands left in Egypt because not everyone left and the community survived. But the really big period is from the mid-19th to the 1950s. 
There was an extensive uh, network of community organizations throughout Egypt, uh, churches, schools, community organizations, uh, orphanages, a, a full range of community organizations. And there, unlike the United States, where the uh, Greek Orthodox Archdiocese is the most dominant uh, institution, there in Egypt, it was the community, because the community was run by the wealthy cotton merchants. So they were, they were uh, able to, um, in a sense, administer the, the churches as well as all the other uh, institutions there in Egypt. And this little map of Egypt here is from a Greek a uh, geography uh, book used in Greek schools uh, in Egypt um, for the Greeks to learn about the geography of the country that they were in. And of course, significantly, the, a little bit like they did in the United States, the Greeks spread everywhere. They weren't only in Alexandria and Cairo, the two main cities, but went further south Southern Egypt is called Upper Egypt, which is a little bit confusing, but the, in the small towns there, um, sometimes the Greeks were the only Europeans. And uh, in many cases, the, there was the, the main store there was the Greek grocer. The, the presence of the Greek grocers was ubiquitous. There's, there's, there's a parallel between Greek-owned diners in the United States and um, Greek grocers in every town in Egypt during the period that we're looking at. The wealthy were very important. Uh, they were important for Egypt and Egypt's economy and also for Greece. Georgios Saverov, a cotton merchant from Metsovo, was the um, wealthy donor of the um, Panathinaic Stadium that um, was constructed for the first uh, Olympic Games in 1896. And he also, in his will in 1899, left enough money for Greece to uh, acquire the battleship Averov. It's actually a dreadnought rather than a battleship. I mentioned this. If anyone's an expert, they're going to pull me up on that. But we call it the battleship Averov, Tothorikto Averov, which was uh, one of the main reasons that Greece was victorious in the Balkan Wars of 1912-1913 and expanded its territory so dramatically and significantly. The Averov was the dominant force in the Aegean. So that's something that the Greeks in Egypt contributed. Another important family was the Benaki family, along with other important cotton merchants they contributed to the community organization in Egypt, and they also made contributions to Greece. The, uh, uh, the, the main figure in the Benaki family, Emmanuel Benakis, was uh, very closely associated. He was a friend of uh, Eleftherios Venizelos, and after Eleftherios Venizelos clashed with King Constantine in 1915 and created what is known as the Ethnikos de Chasmos, the national schism, the polarization between the Venizelists and the royalists in Greece that starts in 1915 and goes right through to World War II, when Venizelos was forced to resign uh, after his clash with the king, he tours uh, Egypt and visits. This is a visit he makes to the um, um, Benaki, uh, one of the Benaki family houses. This is uh, the, the person uh, you see, if you can see my cursor, this is Venizelos. And this person to Venizelos' left is um, Pinelopi Benaki, who becomes Pinelopi Velta, one of the most famous literary figures of 20th century Greece. Uh, it's, it's a sign of the closeness that the Benaki family had with uh, Venizelos. Benaki, of course, goes on to become mayor of Athens and then becomes minister of agriculture with, uh, with Venizelos. He moves from Alexandria 
to uh, Athens to help uh, Venizelos after he takes power and he resumes power after the schism and uh, Emmanuel Benakis is there at his side. When Emmanuel Benakis dies in the late, late 20s, the Benaki family decides to donate the family house, which is in downtown Athens, and, and the house is turned into a museum, which is across from the Greek parliament on uh, uh, its, its uh, uh, a, a main cultural institution in Greece. And Benakis' son, Adonis, was a collector of Islamic art, brings the art over to the Benaki, and it, it's the core of what is now, of course, a very wide-ranging collection of Greek uh, art and artifacts. And, uh, and this is another, another contribution that the wealthy Greeks in Egypt make uh, to Greece. Aside, so I was kicked out um, as I was talking about the Benakis. So I'm gonna share my screen and get back to the, well, I've, I've moved on from the Benakis. Uh, I, I, aside from cotton, there was a range of other activities that the Greeks got involved in because the wealth that the cotton created attracted many people from the rest of the Aegean islands and Greece. And it's important to note that the Suez Canal that opened in 1869 was, the work, uh, largely, not primarily, but largely, the Greek input was huge. Hundreds, thousands of Greeks left the Aegean islands. These two little blue dots show the island of Kassos and Castellorizo. There were other people from Karpathos and other Aegean islands. They went right down to the canal and worked on the canal and, and helped the opening of the canal and then settled in the canal area in those towns along the canal. In fact, the town right at the mouth of the canal where the Mediterranean enters into the canal and goes down southward is called Port Said. But before it was named Port Said, when the canal was opening, the people from Casos had requested from Ferdinand de Lesseps, the French funder who had uh, um, imagined, had dreamt of the canal and, and made the canal become a reality, they asked him to name the town Nea Casos in honor of the many Casiotes who had helped dig and open and administer the canal. But Lesep said he couldn't do that because he had to name it Port Said because the, the, um, uh, the king of Egypt, the, the Khedive of Egypt at the time was called Said and he had to honor Said. Uh, otherwise we would have, it would have been extraordinary if, we, if the Suez Canal had the, the town at the opening of the canal was called Nea Casos, but that, that never happened. Another aspect of the presence of the Greeks in Egypt was, of course, the huge literary production. Um, the two main figures that we know, that everyone knows about is Constantine Cavafy, who is, of course, a poet who is not only a great um, a poet of Greece and the Greek diaspora, but but is a a, a, a poet of world renowned. Stratis Tsirkas is also another figure. Two of, two of them, there are many others. There was a huge Greek literary production as well in Egypt, which gave the community not only uh, a, a kind of economic aspect, but also a very strong a sense of uh, intellectual uh, richness and contributions. There were literary magazines in Egypt where Greek writers wanted to publish in the magazines that the Greeks in Egypt were producing. Um, finally, and this is the last one before I go on to my family history, uh, Alexandria, the, the town on the Mediterranean, which had a huge Greek population, a very big European presence, the biggest European community were the Greeks, renowned cosmopolitan life that started eroding only after NASA Re NASA's revolution in 1952. On the top left, you can see the famous Corniche, the uh, uh, seafront of Alexandria. And on the bottom right is the famous Stanley Beach, where all the Europeans used to go um, during the uh, 
uh, uh, during the, not only the summer months to, uh, to enjoy uh, the Mediterranean. Uh, that's my uh, little presentation of, of this important diaspora community, economics, intellectual life, geographical spread, participation in a very sophisticated European culture. My father's family was part of this environment and I was, I, I, I started learning things about them that I didn't know as I was researching the history of the Greeks in Egypt. My great grandfather, Alexander Theodoru Kitroev, leaves the island of Chios and settles in Alexandria where he marries Polixeni Gavala, who has gone from the small island of Amorgos to Alexandria. And the family then settles in Alexandria. My grandfather was born there, so was my father. And as I said, I was the first to be born in Athens. The, these are the papers of my grandfather I found, and the most uh, important in terms of the research of the, on, on the Greeks is the baptismal record, which exists at the Patriarchate of uh, Alexandria. I wasn't looking at the uh, actual certificate, the baptismal certificate, but I was looking at the uh, uh, at, at the books where all the uh, baptisms were recorded because they have wonderful, wonderful information. They've got the um, origins of both the father and the mother and of the godfather sometimes and their professions. So the baptismal records of the Patriarchate in Alexandria for me were important, A, because I found, uh, I, I, I was able to locate my own family there, but also because one gets tremendously interesting uh, data about the Greeks in Egypt. The, the one in the middle is his birth certificate. The birth certificate was from the municipality of Alexandria. Th this is a certificate that I found in my grandfather's papers, but I assume that the if the municipality has records going back so far, this, was, this is 1903, uh, one can find uh, information. Uh, as you will notice, it's in Arabic and in French. And on the right is a lot of documents that the Greeks in Egypt brought with them when they left Egypt. There was their companies uh, gave them letters um, as, um, confirming the fact that they had served or they had worked in that particular company. This was the, this is the Associated Cotton Ginners of uh, Egypt, and I have two copies of that: one in Arabic and one in uh, in English which um, Greeks in Egypt have, they are not, they don't exist anywhere centrally, but families have these and they attest to the economic activities of persons. Another source that I used both for the getting data and also for the, um, my own interest in my own family were the um, annually produced uh, records, uh, accounts, uh, of the um, community organizations, which I mentioned were the dominant communities. Those uh, reports on the activities of the community have the, mem the members of the community, which were the, the, the executive board and the wealthy persons who were members of the community. And they also sometimes record all the donations other Greeks have. So the logo the, the these reports, are a wonderful source of, um, and th this is the town of uh, Mansura, which my family went through a, a briefly, but there's also, of course, the Alexandria and uh, Cairo community uh, reports are very important sources of, uh, of names and uh, additional information. A lot of those reports were moved from the communities in Egypt to Athens to, to an archive called the Elinikologo Techniko Ke Historico Archio. They were actually physically taken into diplom the diplomatic bags of the Greek consulate and shipped over to Greece. And a lot of the community records are available in this archive in, uh, in Athens. There's, there's other archives where one can find things 
especially the papers of these famous literary figures that I mentioned. And I was quite astounded to find that my great grandfather had actually sent Cavafy a, um, a note which appears in the Cavafy papers in the Onassis archive. Uh, Circas's papers, the, the other writer I mentioned, uh, his papers as well, which are, have got rich correspondence with people, are located in the Elinico Logotechnico Historico Archio. So we have these important personalities with, who have a lot of correspondence and their archives help us uh, find out not only their contacts, but we find out a lot of information about the people who um, uh, were interacting with them. Despite the fact that a lot of stuff was moved from the community organizations of Cairo, uh, Alexandria, and elsewhere to Athens in, uh, in and around 1990, uh, and this is something I found out during my just my recent visit, in Cairo there is a great deal of still archives remaining there is a little compound. This is actually the, the compound. This is the, the Greek compound. This is what is left from the community of Alexandria. The, these are the old uh, schools that the Greeks had, and now they are multi-use things. There's, there's the Averofio Gymnasio, which is still a school. This is another school building that has become the community offices. Uh, this part has become the Greek consulate. There's a Greek club. There's another school. There's a gym. Uh, th there is a, um, a place. Uh, there's a kind of place where guests are put up. This is a little compound right around here. As you can see, it's very central near downtown Alexandria, near the Greek Orthodox Cemetery, and near the, the um, Biblioteca Alexandrina, the new, the new version of the famous Alexandria Library. Um, uh, what is going to happen to those records is actually unknown, but it's something now that I think those of us interested in, the, in recording the history of the Greeks in Egypt are anxiously trying to find out ways of preserving and somehow digitizing and storing those important archives. Everyone thought that uh, uh, most things had been moved in 1990, but it appears that there's still a lot of stuff in these buildings in this Greek compound. Um, however, uh, it's not going to be easy, and this is my final slide, this it's not going to be easy because um, I had a piece in this week's National Herald about our conference, and I, and I described genealogy being as something that Americans are interested in. The Greeks in Egypt are not so much interested in genealogy because they, they, they have this information uh, or they feel they have it. Uh, they may have better access to it. So they're engaged mostly in activities which have to do with remembering their history. There's a great deal of nostalgia. They all loved Egypt. There were very close relations between the Greeks and the Egyptians. So the important association of Greeks from Egypt, which exists in Athens uh, and which has got... Uh, um, an important, uh, it, it's an important venue for, for a lot of activities. Most of those activities are nostalgia. Uh, it's, it's the historians who are interested in the gene, genealogical stuff, but we're going to get our acts together and try and preserve as much as possible. And that is, and, and try and get the Sindes Mosegiptioton Elinon to help us with this project. And with that, um, that those are the Greeks in Egypt for you. And thank you for the opportunity to present them to you. Thank you for this great presentation, Alexandre. Um, I have a question. Sure. Uh, uh, so it was great that you gave us the historical context um, of Greeks, of the Greek community in Egypt, and then your more personal um, family experience. In your work, how do you balance the two? So the, the emotional load from your family, as opposed to the more objective um, uh, stance that you have to uh, keep. 
it's uh, it's an issue. It, it's it's helpful because I get better access to archives because I am considered an Egyptiotis origins wise. And that, uh, and a lot of people are very sensitive about the way Greek historians are going to treat the Greeks in Egypt because the Greeks in Egypt had privileges. So many people are worried that they might be seen as, uh, as people who benefited from colonialism. The Greeks were actually in between colonialism and, and the Egyptians, but there's a sensitivity about how outsiders will view the history. So that gives me a, uh, that gives me great access. And then, of course, I say, well, I was, I'm, I'm, I'm origin. I, I was born in Athens, so I am, and, and I'm a historian. And that enables me to get away with some types of criticism, maybe that others d don't involve. But, but this is a wonderful question, and I'm answering it with a smile, but it's, it's, been, it's, it's a balancing act. And it's something I'm always aware of and wonder, you know, am I being the historian now or am I, you know, is it the emotional stuff? And, you know, I think you, as long as you can try and mobilize both to write history and, and convey information, I think that's okay. Yeah. Yeah. Besides there's something personal in every story that we, so, um, yeah. Okay, well, if you need any help with uh, preserving the archives of uh, the Greek community in Egypt, you can count on us. You Thank know you that. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, good night Thank from you. Athens to Athens. That's we right. We will now proceed with uh, Georgia. Welcome back, Georgia. Well, thank you. That was uh, a good presentation. Oh, yeah. And I really loved the, the combination, the context right. and the personal. I love that. All right. I will introduce you. Okay. And then you can start your presentation. Georgia Stryker Kilman is the founder of the Hellenic Genealogy Geek Facebook group and blog. Georgia's interest in collecting books and documentation on Greek immigrants began, began in the mid 1990s while working and living in Australia. Upon her return to the US, she continued to collect books, articles, and data on the worldwide uh, Greek diaspora. In the year 2010, Georgia formed the Hellenic Geology Geek Facebook group and blog to share all that she has collected with those interested in researching their own family history. The group has grown to over 33.5 thousand members. Georgia strives to encourage people to contribute by helping others and share information. In May 2021, she also launched the Hellenic Genealogy Geek Research Links website, which categorizes thousands of links to websites, databases, articles, books, etc., of interest to people doing genealogy, uh, Greek genealogy research. Floor is yours, Georgia. Okay. Um. Let me just say that when I formed the Hellenic Genealogy Geek Group, well, the website that I just did last year, that was out of frustration because Facebook is a great place to connect. But every day we have many people posting research links, posting websites, articles, books, and um Within a day, you can't even find what was posted yesterday. They stream down the page and get all confused. And so out of frustration, I created this. And I'm going to share my screen now. Is that showing? Yes. Uh, but you have to. Yeah, yeah, I know. Put it in slide. Right. OK. All right, so let's start top. It's, it's, it's on the internet under HellenicGenealogyGeek.com. And you can see that at the top there. We move to the next slide. And underneath the picture, you're going to see um, at the bottom there, the first arrow says 2,331 links and last updated January 22nd, 2022. That gets updated every time I add additional links. 
um, so that at a glance, you're going to be able to see if it was updated since the last time you visited. Also, you can't really see the box very well, but there's a search box there by the second arrow. And this is great if you want to, instead of going through all the categories that I'm going to show you, you want to just do a search on everything that has been written on Sparta that we've got on the research link. It'll pull up all the different links for you that way. Okay, so what you're gonna see once you scroll down the page are two columns. On the left, you're going to see, um, starting with the Greek names and books, but then as you go down, I wanted you to notice where the Greek, where the uh, blue arrow is. I also say how many links there are and when it was last updated. So let's say you were looking for or, um, information on adoptions. You know that I put something new in on January 17th. And so you can do that. Now, if you just visited yesterday, you know I haven't added anything else in. Um, so let's look at the first category, Greek names in books. These are names that have been extracted from books. Um, and we put them into a a Excel spreadsheet. So when you click on the link, this is where you're going to go. And what you'll see is um, all of the names in alphabetical order by surname in the first column. Second column is the name of the book, the title of the book. And the third column is the link to either a blog posting or maybe directly to the book if it's available online. There also is a second tab, which is book titles. So you can just glance through here to see which books we have extracted names from yet. And I have thousands of additional names to add to this list. So, um, Also, if you look at the different categories, what you're going to see is that as you click on a category, let's say Asia Minor, you're going to see Online databases, where the blue arrow is, online databases, films and videos, websites, articles, books. Each of those categories is listed down below with a red highlight. And, um, and again, all of the posts underneath it will say when that was added. So it will be easy for you to see if these are new links. So this particular... Um, database and I can't see because these pictures are in the way. Can I move those up? Yeah. Um, we have six online databases, 10 films and videos, 21 websites, 48 articles, and 24 books. And I have a lot more to add to this. And um, this is a topic of great interest to our members. So if you um, have something that I don't already have, please send me an email. You'll see that my um, my email address is at the top of each page, and I'd love to get suggestions. So, adoptions and orphans. Um, right after me, Linda Forrest, Linda Trotter will be speaking, and she is a member of our group and helps add material at all times. Also, um, Professor Gonda Von Steen, who has done a lot of research in this area, keeps us updated. So what you see here is this is a big area of interest because there were all these adoptions that were done out of Greece between like 1948 and the 1960s. So we always get a lot of questions on that. And so we've got 28 articles, 10 books, seven websites or Facebook groups and four videos for you to use. Culture and traditions. Well, Alexander was just talking about this, and so was um, Nicholas Gage, where we don't necessarily carry the heritage down to next generations. And um, we have a lot of people in our group that weren't brought up as Greek Orthodox or in a Greek, understanding the Greek culture. And so we've added some links here for them to use that will help educate them. Now, the Greek diaspora communities. Look, at this. I've got 949 links on here, and no, I am missing a lot. 
showing 39 countries. The um, top countries are at the top with the most links. And if you click on the United States, which you're gonna get our individual links for each state because there's so many of the articles. But once you scroll down, you'll also see Africa, Albania, Argentina, every country listed. And again, the number of links and when it was last updated. Directories. I love directories. And um, we, there really are very few available online. We've got um, four from Greece here, which links to some of the things that Gregory has done but we have six from the United States. And there are others that have been published, but I haven't been able to get my hands on them. Um, the, the libraries don't want to loan them out or they're not online. So I'm on the hunt for these. If anybody knows anything, let me know. We currently have the People's Guide by Scott Apoulos, which was done in 1920, which has photographs and gives a little summary of each person. I was able to get that through an interlibrary loan and digitize it and put it out there and index it for you guys. The Associated Greek Business Guide and Directory of the Western States was sent to me by one of our members. And um, I was able to digitize that also and index it. The Canudas books are great. I only We only have a link to one of them here. I would like to get my hands on the rest of them. I don't know why they're not all digitized. And then we have the, um, sorry, I moved ahead too fast. The um, Greek American Guide by Helms that was done in 1915. So if anybody knows of anything, please let us know because we'd like to add it so everybody can take advantage of it. DNA. DNA is um, a subject that always comes up. And it's very difficult to comprehend for me. <laughs> so we've added 37 links on different aspects of DNA, articles, Facebook groups, the basics of it, DNA testing comparisons, and the companies, what's this, and the DNA ethnicity estimates, communicating with DNA cousins, and DNA triangulation. Now, Greece, we have 108 links on here. I have a lot more to include. And um, the problem is I need to break this down by region, I think an administrative dis district to make it easier, but we've got 49 articles, 43 books, uh, six online databases and websites and 11 videos. So um, I want to expand this quite a bit and um, I need to find the time to do that. This is just, uh, people are always asking about place name changes and that. So what we've got are seven links here to help you not only with place name changes in Greece, but also in Turkey. We've got um, Greek genealogy for beginners. Um, and this has a, 23 links on it, but they're all general, um, like how to help you do research um, not only in Greece, but here. Greek language and handwriting. We need to expand this a little bit here because what we've got is, um, is there's always an interest in the Greek language and Greek handwriting. I would love to have additional, we have five links right now, but I would love to have additional links that have to do with how do you read Greek handwriting so that everybody can get some help on that. Greek names, we've got 17 links on Greek names. There's always questions about that. Where did the name come from? And also a little summary from Wikipedia about the Turkish surname law, about when people had to change their surnames. Okay, Greek records. This is also something we need to reorganize a little bit because we now have 334 links on this site, which is uh, resources for Greek records, uh, Record collections, Greek ancestries record collections are included in here, um, tools and educational materials. Jewish communities, um, there's a lot of interest in that also. And so we've included 
as many databases as we can find. Libraries. Now, these aren't just libraries. Um, hopefully, a lot of them are the local libraries that you can use when you go there. And we'll discuss this a little bit later when I talk about something else. Maps. We've got 39 maps. We need to add more here. So if you have any suggestions, please let us know. Museums. These are not museums that have to do with archaeology. These are mostly folklore museums or folk museums in the villages or museums about worry beads or, or tobacco or all of the different things that they had going on in Greece. It's very interesting. And a lot of them have great online museum information. Oral histories. Some of these are oral histories that are done with individuals, but some of them are more about oral history projects where you'll be able to see many interviews. Like the first one, the Greeks in Washington has a great project going. The National Hellenic Museum in Chicago is working on it. We have uh, this other one, interviews with Anatolian immigrants in Greece, which is interesting. So this is, these are cool places to hang out. Using a professional genealogist, we did this last year um, because people were having some issues with how to deal with a genealogist. They need to understand what it is that they need to present when they want to have research done. And um, so we, we put together a code of ethics, a request for a quotation and an example of a research report so you know what to expect. Wars and military, this is an, uh, an area that I think people have um, missed and need to look at. Many of these links show names of the people that served in the military. So it's a resource that you should definitely check out. Now, here's the last part. Village histories and community trees. We um, have part of a page here that I've created that shows um, a lot of village history books. This is just part of it. Carol, when she went to um, Sparta several years ago, she went to the library and took photos of every single book they had on village histories. So we're going to add those in here and give you information about where to look and what to do when, in fact, you go to Greece. All right. Also, there's a lot that have been published, and we're trying to locate those and give you information here. It's sorted by um, the region and then by village. So you should be able to find multiple ones for your village if, in fact, ones have been written. And that's it, really. I just wanted to familiarize you with what's going on here and, um, and hope everybody enjoys it. Thank you very much, Georgia. Okay. What you've done is really great because there is a, pl a free place for people to go and access thousands of resources. Thank you. I use you. it all the time myself. <laughs> <laughs> I can't remember. <laughs> and the way that you have categorized them now is so easier for people to use. Oh, thank you. So Linda Carroll Trotter is a Greek-born adoptee and the president of the Eftihia Project. Born Eftihia Nula in Stranoma, Nafpaktia, she, has adopted, she was adopted in 1958 as an infant from the municipal foundling's home of Athens by American parents. After finding her biological mother in Greece in 2017, Linda wanted to help other Greek-born adoptees find their biological families. With the help of like-minded friends, in 2019, she founded the Eftihia Project, a US-based nonprofit organization which assists and supports free of charge Greek-born adoptees searching for their roots and Greek families searching for their children lost to adoption. To date, the Eftihia project has facilitated the reconnections of 11 adoptees with their biological families in Greece. Advocating on behalf of all Greek-born adoptees with the Greek government has led the fight for their birth and identity rights especially their birthright to Greek citizenship. So, hello, Linda. Hello. Can you hear me now? I finally got myself unmuted and I got my video going. <laughs> we, you are great. You're great now. 
All right. <laughs> Welcome and thank, thank you. you. Thank you for being here. Well, thank you for, for having me. It's uh, great. I enjoyed the conference very much uh, last year. I was actually in Greece again last year when I when I watched the conference uh, those those couple of days, and we were under lockdown at the time, so I know you remember that. Uh, but we're, we're certainly grateful to be here and be able to talk about the Ethikia Project and about the Greek adoptees today. Great. I already introduced you, so you are ready to go. All right. Well, I'm going to I'm going to share my screen because cool. I have a, a PowerPoint uh, presentation. Let me get on my screen here. Um, my slideshow, start my show. Oh, there we go. Um, so um, I'm uh, pleased. We're so pleased to be here to be able to be at the conference with all of you guys today. And uh, to talk about um, the, the Greek born adoptees, which have gotten a lot of attention lately um, in the press here in Greece uh, and all over uh, the world recently. Um, and uh, just a little bit of background about the Greek adoptions. Uh, the, the, main, the main group of Greek adoptees that, that uh, went abroad from Greece were in the 50s, the decades of the 50s and the 60s. Um, there were thousands of Greek adoptees who ended up in America, some in Holland. We've even had contact from adoptees who actually were adopted to, by Greek American, or I'm sorry, Greek uh, Greek uh, born people uh, in South uh, South Africa, in Sweden, in Australia. So we've had people contact us from all over, even Cyprus. Um, so it's it's amazing. Uh, Greeks are everywhere, and Greek adoptees are also everywhere. Um, and uh, today we wanted to give you a little bit uh, about. Uh, the Greek adoptees about what the Eftikia project is and what we do. And um, we hope that this will help a lot of people, uh, adoptees, Greek families who are searching for lost uh, uh, children that were lost or presumably lost to adoption as well. So um, the Eftikia project, we are a 501c3 nonprofit organization. We're designated as a public charity and tax exempt by the IRS in America. Um, we assist and support free of charge Greek born adoptees searching for their roots and Greek families searching for their lost children. Uh, a lot of these families are looking for children that they willingly or knowing or may have been coerced into giving up for adoption. And some of these families are also searching for children that were lost in what we typically call the dead baby scam. In other words, um, they were told after about three days, oh, the baby died. We're so sorry. Uh, they ask for the body of the baby. They're not given the body of the baby. Uh, they say, oh, we've already buried it with other babies or we've, um, we've uh, put it in lime already, sorry. Uh, and then there's no birth certificate, no death certificate. However, after like 18 years for guys, sometimes the army comes calling with a letter for a baby that supposedly had died, but yet there must be no death certificate and somehow they wound up on the mail register for army service. So um, those families are, are, are coming forward in huge numbers now. Um, we never ask a Greek adoptee or a Greek family who has re uh, requested our assistance for money or donations of any kind. All of our help is free. Uh, we do this because uh, many of us have been, I want to uh, try, people have tried to take advantage of us by asking for money and then not doing things, people here in Greece, people in America. And so we didn't want any adoptee to feel like they had to pay for something that we feel is their birthright to know about where they came from. Um, we provide guidance and advice and facilitate searches for and reunions with biological family, as well as post reunion and ongoing support. So we try to support adoptees through uh, the entire process and Greek families as well. Um, we have uh, a DNA kit distribution program that we started in, uh, at the end of July in 2020. Um, and we distribute kits, for, DNA kits for free to families in Greece and to adoptees with financial need because um, our big, our big push is to get more Greeks in Greece in the DNA pool because that will help all of us. Uh, and so uh, we started out, we bought 12 DNA kits ourselves for the first when, when we did our first 12. Uh, and then uh, people began to ask how they could help us. So we said, well, if you want to donate DNA kits. So they were donating DNA kits. Um, we've now done about 100 uh, DNA. Um, we've collected uh, DNA from 100 uh, people um, since we started last, last, the end of last July. 
And uh, now uh, we're, we were pleased that um, there was an article in the Greek Reporter that came out a few months ago about our DNA uh, program, because we drive all over Greece collecting DNA and visiting with these families um, to help them uh, when they ask us for help looking for an adoptee. And um, my heritage DNA company, uh, and I believe we have um, one of the genealogists from Daniel Horowitz is going to be talking also um, during the conference. Um, they contacted us, had seen what we had been doing. They didn't know anybody in Greece was doing this. And they we now have an official collaboration with MyHeritage and they're providing all kinds of support for us. And it's been a wonderful, wonderful thing. And we're so grateful to MyHeritage for that. Um, and then also we advocate, one of the biggest things we're doing right now, we advocate on behalf of all Greek born adoptees with the Greek government for the four major issues that we feel like uh, Greek adoptees are, are uh, most concerned about. Transparency from the government about our adoptions, unfettered access to our adoption, orphanage and birth records, um, a collaborative DNA database for adoptees and their biological families. We've already started one basically, so we would like for the government of Greece to collaborate with us to help us to support that effort. And then the biggest thing right now on the table is Greek citizenship for all Greek born adoptees, because that's part of our birth and identity rights. We were born in Greece and it's extremely hurtful when, when uh, celebrities get Greek citizenship and some of them aren't Greek at all. And it's very hurtful to people who were actually born here and especially adoptees who only want what non-adopted people take for granted where they came from and their own birth, their own identity and where their roots are. Um, we have a fabulous board of directors, um, the people that uh, support us and, and help, uh, help all the efforts of the FTKIA project. Um, I'm uh, the founder and the president and I'm also the Greek family intake coordinator. I deal with all the Greek families that, that want to help from us, that request help to uh, want DNA tests or want to have their story posted on our Facebook page. Uh, Meryl Jenkins. Uh, and I put, I put our names of what our, our, bio, uh, our birth names were. So mine was Estekia Nula. Um, and the Estekia project was named not because my name is Estekia, but because of what Estekia means, which it means happiness for those who don't know. So it's the happiness project. Um, and I'm, uh, so I deal with the, with the families. Uh, Meryl Jenkins, who is Mitsos Dimitrios, who came from the Patras Orphanage, and he's our treasurer. Maria Heckinger, who is Maria Vukalatu. Um, she's our secretary and also our, the volunteer coordinator for our new volunteer program. And then Stephanie Pazoles, who was Penelope Odysseus. Uh, and she's our adoptee intake coordinator. So a lot of you um, people that are maybe watching may have been ta have talked to Stephanie at some point. Um, and um, especially adoptees. Uh, and Stephanie's great with, uh, with DNA and gene genealogy and all of that sort of thing. She's good at that. And we have other people that help us too that are also really good at that. Meryl's great at spreadsheets. Maria is a great organizer and a, and a person with just a bubbly personality. So we have a good group and we're all, uh, the Maria, Meryl and Stephanie all came from the Patras Orphanage and I came from the Athens Municipal Orphanage. Um, what we aren't, and this is kind of important because um, we get a lot of requests from people for help and it's really not in our, in our purview. And so I just, you know, we're not a Facebook group. There's a lot of things that are Facebook groups. We're, we're a Facebook page. We're a nonprofit organization. We have a Facebook page. You, membership in a group of any kind isn't required to ask for our help or to attend any of our events. Um, it doesn't matter if you belong to some other Greek adoptee Facebook group or some other organization, you're welcome, we'll help anybody. Uh, if you're a Greek adoptee, a Greek family, or if you're just interested in our cause, all of you are welcome. And so we encourage you to follow our Facebook page and um, to visit our website for the latest news and updates. And our scope is limited to Greek born adoptees, to Greek adoptees born in Greece, who were either adopted abroad or remained in Greece, we still help those adoptees too, and Greek families searching for their children lost to adoption or presumably lost to adoption. Um, we get a lot of things like, you know, great grandpa migrated to America, went back to Greece, we lost track of him, can you help me find him? And um, we're kind of like, no, we, that's not, that's a little out of our scope. Um, or I did a DNA test and I found out, oh wow, I have Greek ancestry, can you, I want to know about my unknown Greek relatives. Yeah, we don't do that either. Um, and then some people were, were born and adopted um, outside of Greece, and they have found out, they just happened to find out with DNA that, gee, I'm half Greek, one of my parents must be Greek. So, um, and again, you know, we deal with Greek-born adoptees and the Greek families. 
Um, for all those situations, though, we always suggest that everybody join the Greek genealogy groups on Facebook. Um, Hellenic Genealogy Geek, Greek Ancestry and History, Hellenic Genealogy Resources, DNA Greek. There's a bunch of them out there. And uh, we encourage people to post their story there because especially if you're looking for lost relatives, it's people on Hellenic Genealogy Geek and these other sites have been so incredibly helpful to people and to adoptees as well. Like they have uh, gone above and beyond in helping people find their biological family. And it's been an amazing thing to see all of these other groups help out. The other thing people can do is if you have a name and an approximate last location in Greece, you can actually contact the Hellenic Red Cross Tracing Service in Greece and make a request to have that person traced. And if they find that person or the family, they can give them your information. They can, you can, um, and they can uh, contact you then if they would like to have contact. Uh, it's our hope in the future we might be able to expand our services to do that, but right now we just don't have the resources to do anything other than what our the scope of our organization is. And we put a special emphasis on those adoptions that happened in the 50s and 60s because, as many of you know already, that many of those adoptions were not really above board. They were. Uh, it was kind of a bitter and, and tragic history of Greece and. Um, it's, it's finally became, becoming acknowledged that we exist. So that's a cool thing that at least now they're starting to notice, the government's starting to take notice, the people of Greece are starting to take notice and a lot more people know about these adoptions. Um, we do, uh, as far as searching, because you know the title of our thing is uh, Search Reunion uh, Advocacy and Education. We provide guidance, support and advice to adoptees and biological families. Um, you know, we provide tools and resources for obtaining immigration files, your uh, orphanage court, birth records from Greece. Uh, we post adoptee and family stories on our Facebook page. Um, and we have a lot of connections with members of the news media here in Greece. And a lot of them pick up our stories off of our Facebook page. And lo and behold, they're on all these little uh, Greek news websites all over Greece. So um, we've had a lot of traction from a lot of a lot of places here, and so that's been since we're very visible here in Greece. It's been uh, to have that. We never post stories that we're not that we haven't been given full permission to, or pictures. Uh, the families and adoptees have to give us explicit permission to post things. Or and if people don't want names mentioned, or they don't they want to keep some things private, we do our best to keep everything like that. It's uh, it's all up to the family and to the adoptee as, as to what they want to post. Um, we also facilitate contact between adoptees and their biological families. At some point, we get enough clues to who we're looking for that we're able to approach families um, or adoptees on behalf of families. And, and in many cases, we uh, refer that to the agencies that do this. There were a lot of kids that came through the ISS, the International Social Service. And if we have uh, people that have uh, been through the International Social Service, we try to leave that to them to facilitate the contact because they do have ways to do that here in Greece. And the ISS has been extremely helpful to all of us. Plus, they're now digitizing all of their records, which is great. And that's what the Greek government needs to do with our adoption records as well. They need to have them all digitized. Um, we provide the DNA kits, of course, free of charge to the Greek families and to the adoptees with need. Um, for reunions, um, we provide guidance and support and advice for that as well. Uh, those of us who have had, been had reunions with family, and of course, I've lived off and on in Greece. I live about six months out of the year here, so I've really gotten immersed into the culture, into the mindset, and all of that. Um, we provide that kind of support um, because several of us, uh, Maria's reunited with her family as well. So we have, we try to give advice based on our experiences with our biological families because you're really uh, starting to come together with people that are that are virtual strangers and they don't speak your language so it's it's a in the culture is completely different if you weren't raised in a greek american household and even then it's a little bit different as well so you have to get used to that and so some people get a little stressed over the differences and stuff and we try to help in that regard to to give them advice and support if it's desired, we'll help facilitate the reunion, be present if we're if it's requested, if they'd like for us to be there. I've been present for a couple of them um, and serve basically as the photographer and a little bit of a translator. My Greek's not that good, but I get the gist of everything. So, so it's not too bad. So um, I help a little bit in that regard and whatever the adoptee wants. Uh, people, adoptees have even stayed with me during their reunions and had a place to decompress in private because it's it's difficult. It's a very emotional um, situation when you when you reunite with your family. 
Um, we provide post reunion support um, for anything that they might need and ongoing support. Um, you know, they may need a little help with translation or a phone call or a video chat or something, or they need someone to speak Greek to one of their family because they can't find any English speaking members. Um, and we provide that support as long as people want it, but we encourage all adoptees to gradually become self-sufficient in their contacts and their interactions with their biological families, because at some point you have to, you know, you have to uh, cut the apron strings and, and fly on your own. So um, we encourage everybody to become self-sufficient uh, eventually uh, and not depend on someone else, because you may not have uh, the luxury of having somebody who speaks both languages to help you with translations and stuff all the time. Um, our big push right now is our advocacy and activism that we've been working on with, with on behalf of all Greek born adoptees. Um, and this is just basically our beliefs. We believe the knowledge of our roots and biological families are basic human rights of all adoptees. We believe we're entitled to transparency. We're entitled to our records. Um, we believe that all Greek born adoptees are entitled to Greek citizenship by birthright and that it should be expedited. And it shouldn't cost us anything because we didn't ask to leave. We were, our fights were decided for us and we didn't have any say in it. So we shouldn't have to uh, spend huge amounts of money, which some adoptees already have and have nothing. They still don't have their citizenship um, to, to get back what is ours by birthright. We all left here with Greek passports that said we were Greek and we were of the Greek nationality. We were born here and that's, you know, what we believe that proves right there we're Greek citizens. And actually in one of the meetings that uh, we had with the with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, we met with uh, Deputy Minister Katsaniotis and Mr. Margaritis, who's the director of the diplomatic cabinet. They admitted that if we have those Greek passports, they agreed with me, we're Greek citizens. Now they're expired and all we have to do is figure out a way to prove that the person on the passport is us but once you do that, that shouldn't be a problem and it should be something easy. They don't need to make this difficult for any of us. Um, and we believe that we're entitled to the establishment of the, by, of the database, a collaborative database where the Greek government actually helps us. So up to now, we've done a lot, I believe. We've worked really hard over the last year and a half trying to make it inroads with the government. We have the support of one of the members of parliament, Stathis Konstantinidis of Kozani. He's a member of the Greek parliament. He made a speech to Greek parliament where he talked about us and about our cause and how we should be citizens and that Greece owes it to us to make this right. Uh, and also he was helpful in the facilitation of the appointment with the, with the, the deputy minister of the, of the diaspora Greeks and the uh, minister of Katsaniotis. Uh, we have received wonderful support from the Greek ambassador to the United States, uh, Madam Papadopoulou. Um, she facilitated an appointment with the Ministry of Labor and Social Affairs regarding our orphanage and birth records. And they, the, uh, the embassy in DC is still giving us uh, continuing and ongoing support um, whenever we need anything. Uh, they have asked to be kept abreast of everything that we're doing. Um, we did meet with the department head of orphanage and foster care in the Ministry of Labor and Social Affairs, and they are working on uh, and committed to working on a centralized streamlined process for adoptees to request and receive their orphanage records. Uh, we're still waiting on some more from that, and we should be meeting in the next couple of weeks again to see where we are in that process. Um, and of course, I just talked about the meeting with, uh, with uh, Deputy Minister Katsaniotis uh, and Mr. Margaritis, and we presented a formal statement to the Greek government of those four issues that we consider important. And we also offered proposed solutions to all of them, including the citizenship issue. Um, we have a, a petition on change.org called Justice for Greek Born Adoptees Now that we hope um, everybody will go to and sign for us. Um, and we address the petition, of course, to, to Prime Minister uh, Mitsotakis and to uh, to, uh, to the Ministry of the Interior and those people that are responsible for citizenship. And we have some very high level government meetings coming up in the next couple of weeks. So stay tuned for some updates, follow our Facebook page or our website because we really feel like the ball is starting to roll and we think there's some good stuff coming very soon. So we're gonna keep everybody abreast of that. Um, we do education. Um, our, uh, our educational uh, things include, um, we have a thing called Greek Adoptee Conversations, where um, we do Zoom, interactive Zoom meetings where the, the adoptees can actually uh, interrupt and talk and do things. We have, it's kind of guided, we have a subject, 
Um, and we have other people who aren't adoptees. Many members of Hellenic Genealogy Geek um, usually uh, come to our to our meetings because they're very uh, they're in from Greek ancestry and history. They're very interested in what we're doing. They're very supportive, so they like to come and listen to what's going on. Um, so we talk about our ad. We've had three of those conversations so far. We do one about every two months. They last usually. We're slated to last a couple of hours. Most of the time they go into three hours because the adoptees want to still, or the families, whoever's present wants to stay around and talk. So we have, we talked, we had one on advocacy and activism with a little bit of the stuff we just talked about. We have um, periodically Greek coffee hour um, where we talk about, we have Greek adoptees talk about their stories or our Greek families. And that really fosters, gives, uh, fosters a sense of camaraderie and in bonding because we all came from the same circumstances. I've often said that um, our stories are all different and yet they're all the same because we all came from the same background and the same type of circumstances here in Greece. So this really is an opportunity for people to talk about their situations, their adoptions, because some people's adoptions weren't pretty. They didn't have good parents. I was fortunate, I had wonderful parents. Not everybody did. And it's very sad to hear some of these stories. But it's also liberating for them to talk about this with other Greek adoptees who they feel a bond to. Um, we did one just the, our last one was, uh, which we did last weekend, was a search for roots and reunion. And we talked about the tools we use to do that and how we facilitate that. We have a lot of forms that we provide to adoptees because sometimes they're hard to find online. Uh, so we kind of we give them that with instructions so it makes it easier to fill out forms if they want their immigration files, if they want us to try to retrieve records for them in Greece, because we do have we do have the ability to do that with a limited power of attorney form that we have. And so I, I make frequent trips to, to the GAK, the General Archives of the State, or some of the orphanage or, uh, orphanages or institutions to get records for people to bring them back to the States when I come back home. Uh, one of our other things we started doing with uh, with the Alexandria Institute in Athens, which is actually where I take Greek lessons, um, they uh, have furnished us with a Greek word of the day. Uh, and so periodically each week we put out Greek words for people to learn because that's part of the, the educational aspect for adoptees. They haven't been exposed to their language and that's what we do. We want to help with that. We also have the FTKIA Project YouTube channel. Um, and all of our all of our events that we do, all of our sessions, our Greek adoptee conversations are all recorded and they're all there. Also, uh, the the great documentary, The Lost Children of uh, Cold War Greece, that was done by Sofia Papiwanu for Alpha TV uh, in April of 2019 is on there as well with English subtitles for the Greek portions. So if you go to the FTK Project YouTube channel, you can see that and a lot of, there's other videos as well. Uh, news videos. We run a lady Minagaki here in Greece. And so those are there as well as all the sessions that we've done and uh, the Greek uh, virtual Greek adoptee reunion we did this past August. Um, we have a lot of webinars and events, the My Heritage Facebook Live event we just did recently. We were doing, uh, we, I was interviewed by Gregory on Greek ancestry last year. Um, we just, we're doing now the second International Greek Ancestry Conference. Uh, and we have the first annual Greek adoptee reunion coming up August 5th and 6th in Nashville, Tennessee, which is the, known as the Athens of the South. And uh, it's, we also have the world's only uh, full-size replica of the Parthenon. So we have that. And, and uh, so we're, we thought that we thought it's a great place to start for that. And our second annual Greek adoptee reunion is going to be in, in Greece, uh, we'll, and we'll have the dates for that announced later, but uh, we're gonna have that actually here. And we hope to have then a lot of the Greek families to also uh, did. And this is just a reminder about the Greek annual, the our first annual Greek adoptee reunion, which we can't wait to see everybody there. We're excited about that. And um, if you if, her, uh, if you are, you just dying to volunteer for something, we need, we need help. We need search angels. We need DNA genealogy help. Genealogy help. We can use translators. In, we need an intake coordinator for Greece and one for Canada, EU, and Australia. Uh, we need a, a DNA kit distribution program coordinator. We could use office staff in the USA and Greece. And so if you would love to volunteer, uh, shoot us an email. We'd love to hear from you. And last but not least, uh, this is just our contact information, our social media in our in our addresses um, in in, um, in in the U.S. and in Greece. Um, so um, 
I've been, it's, it's been exciting to be here with you guys. Um, if um, you guys, anybody that wants to, to know what we're up to, please like and follow the Facebook page, go to the website. Um, and if you would love to volunteer and help us, we would love to have you. We know there's lots of people uh, that's listening today that are great at genealogy and this DNA, family trees, whatever you can do it would be greatly appreciated. Thank you very much, Linda. It's, it's great to see how your project, something that was literally born out of you <laughs> and all your experience, uh, personal and in doing this. It's great. Um, one quick question. You are here in Greece now. Yes. On another mission. Yes. <laughs> how, many, how many people are you going to DNA test? I've already done 20. And I got more. I actually have, I had, um, and the last time I was in Athens, the week before last, um, I had at least four people tell me they had COVID. So I was like, no, I'm not coming to your house. Um, and so um, I have some people that are now after two weeks have probably recovered. I can probably safely see them, but I have been, I've been to, uh, I've been to the Peloponnese. I've been to Laconia. Uh, La I've been to uh, Mistra. I've been to Athens. I've been to Larimna. I went to uh, um, Santi. I've been to wow. Kozani. I've been to Thessaloniki already. And I've already done that. Um, so it's like people are all over. It's amazing how many people have found out what we're doing with the DNA. And it's so important. And I was like, I want to just encourage everybody to do DNA because the more Greeks that do DNA, we're going to, we're going to have more adoptees find their families and right. get that closure and that sense of peace, because that's the most amazing thing. I mean, the greatest joy in my life has been founding my biological family and being able to be assimilated into the Greek culture. Like I have, it's just, it's been a gift and it's been yeah. an amazing gift. And I'm just, I'm, I'm so happy to, I want to share that with everybody else. And I want other adoptees to feel that as well. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. You're we welcome. will now um, move to the next presentation uh, by Sofia Pizzinelli. Let me briefly introduce Sofia. Sofia Pizzinelli is a graduate of the Department of History and Archaeology of the National and Cappadocian University of Athens. She has served as a volunteer at the Center for Asia Minor Studies, the War Museum of Athens, and the Army History Directorate, and currently works as a historian and research assistant at Greek Ancestry. So Sophia will now come to, we are together. We, she will uh, replace me here. Give us one moment. Hello everyone, I'm Sophia. Thank you, Gregory. Uh, it is an honor to participate in this event and to be given the opportunity to discuss an obscure part of Greek history, the Greek experience of World War II, at the same time horrific and heroic. My presentation will begin with a brief introduction to World War II Greece. Then a presentation of the Nazi ideology will introduce us to the strategy of reprisals and the sufferings of Greeks. These sufferings will be presented through the testimonies of Greek resistance fighters who were executed by the Nazis. As it will be shown, the Greek Orthodox Church played a key role in the preservation of these testimonies and dead the families of those imprisoned and executed. World War II started in Greece in October 1940 after the Greek Prime Minister rejection 
of the fascist Stalin request for passes and occupation of strategic points of the country. After the humiliating failure of the Italian invasion in Greece in April 1941, it was the turn of the German army to invade. Greece was divided into three occupation zones. Germany held Athens, Thessaloniki, the central and western parts of Crete, some islands of northeastern Aegean and the part of eastern Thrak. Bulgaria occupied the rest of Thrak and the part of eastern Macedonia, while the rest of Greece was controlled by Italy. King George II of Greece and members of the legitimate legitimate Greek government fled to Cairo, Egypt, while a pro-German prime minister, Georgios Tsolakoglu, was appointed in Athens. The Greek people decided to resist in 1942. The first resistance groups against the Nazi regime started to be organized. Most of them were active in the mountains and their activity was organized and targeted. This fact bothered the Nazis who decided to seek effective solutions. Uh, now let's briefly examine the Nazi ideology and strategy. The Nazi ideology was based on the idea of the Aryan tribe. Jews, Slavs, communists, homosexuals, and other groups were considered inferior. Their extermination was necessary for the domination of the Aryan tribe and the genetic de development of humanity. The same fate awaited anyone threatening the Nazi regime and its plan. As for Greece, the Nazi ideology and Hitler himself admired the ancient Greek civilization and considered modern Greeks as a more or less fine race. Nevertheless, the strengthening of the resistance and the spread of the communism in Greece soon led the Nazis to emphasize the Balkan characteristic of the Greek people. In their minds, the Balkan fighter was a savage, an antisocial person, a dropout without any civil or military honor, like a common criminal. Therefore, getting rid of Balkan fighters and those who supported them was a necessity which entailed no guilt. But the most cruel and horrible Nazi method was reprisals. Reprisals were based on specific orders. If one German soldier was killed, 100 Greek people should be executed. A certain example of a group execution is that of May 1st, 1944. In April, a German general and three soldiers had been killed in Molay. In revenge, the Nazis killed random men in Molay and other towns nearby. 100 people suspicious of or arrested for resistance activity, as well as 200 resistance prisoners in Athens. These 200 prisoners were executed in Kesaryani. Executions were massive and personal. Usually, the Nazis did not even mention whom they were going to execute. The information was difficult to transfer and the families of prisoners did not know whether their people had been executed or not. For instance, in the case of the May 1st, 1944 execution in Kesaryani, the names of the executed were not officially announced and the families of prisoners had to identify their people by looking for their clothes. A woman found the jacket of her older son only to find the clothes of her younger son soon afterwards. Another woman found the jacket of her son. She faded. A few days later, she learned that her son had not been executed, but had led his jacket to a friend of his in prison. From a situation like this arose the need for the collection of information. In April 1943, by order of Archbishop Damaskinos, a special office known as the Second Office was established at the Archdiocese. Its official name... Sorry, no. sorry for an interruption, Sophia. There, might, there must be some problem with screen sharing. Uh, we are telling, they are telling us there is some problem with screen sharing. So guys, please, please excuse us for a moment. Sorry, Sophia. I hope it's better now. So you can uh, start from where uh, you can continue from wherever you. Okay. Uh, let's continue for the second office. Uh, 
Its official name of this office was Service for the Protection of Orphan Families. Its main purpose was first to collect information about the people who had been executed and inform their families, and second, to aid these families financially and morally in order to help them meet their basic needs. Director of the second office became Ioana Tzatsu. Ioana was born in Smyrna in 1909. She was the sister of poet Georgios Seferis and wife of politician Konstantinos Tzatsu. She had studied law and actively participated in the resistance against the Nazi occupation. Also, she took part in relief missions for the families of the executed and helped British soldiers flee Greece. With great efforts of the Archdiocese, the regional churches and Ioana herself, names of executed people started being collected as well as information about their background, their arrest, imprisonment and execution. At the same time, the office started offering support to the families of the executed. At first, it was helping 45 families. By December 1943, their number had risen to 1,854 families. In July 1944, at the end of the war, it was supporting 5,923 families. The second office managed to keep some of the information it had collected despite the Germans' relentless efforts to confiscate its records and end its operations. With the end of the war, the office gave its records to the corresponding ministry. However, during the events of December 1944, some of the records were destroyed. In 1945 and 1946, during the Nuremberg trial where Nazi officials were tried, Johanna Tzatsu offered information in the Greek representatives on behalf of the second office. This gave her the idea to actually publish the surviving information of the second office. She compiled the list and recorded the stories of the executed. Her book, Executed During the Occupation, was published in 1947 with the permission of the of the archdiocese. This list, however, is not exhaustive. It includes about 800 names, while according to Ioana, about 20,000 Greeks had been executed during the occupation. I will now present three different stories as preserved by the archdiocese and published by Ioana Tzatsu. These stories convey the horrible experience and the heroic character of the executed Greek resistance fighters. The protagonist of the first story is Elias Canaris. Elias Canaris was born in Smyrna in 1911 and lived in Athens on 14th Theotoki Street and he worked as an engineer. After the German invasion, Canaris, together with friends, organized a temperature service for Egypt, transferred Greek and British officers, soldiers and individuals. In April 1941, Canaris was arrested by the Germans and imprisoned. During interrogations, they forced him to take them to the location from where they bought the temperature for Egypt. Accompanied by seven Gestapo police officers, he went to the village of Athievia and showed them his friend's house where a transmitter was hidden. When they arrived, he told the Germans to stay outside and lay him in together with only one officer. As soon as he entered the house with the officer, he and his friend disarmed the officer and escaped from the back door. He was hiding for seven months in Halkida, and when he was caught, he was arrested and sentenced to death for attempted murder, illegal possession of a weapon and transmitter, and for his escape. While in prison, Elias wrote to his family before his execution. It, Elias, sorry, Elias wrote letters to his family. Before his execution, he gave these letters to the priest who visited him in the prison for a last confession. The priest then gave the, gave the letters to the family of Elias. Here are two of his letters. The first one was written to his brother. My brother, I am the most several judge of all. No convict has been sentenced to death three times. I have broken every record and now that I am writing to you, I am laughing. I want you to invite all your friends for dinner and read them my letter. I don't want anyone to cry. I want you to behave like men and like Greeks. I am dying for my homeland, Patrida, and you should do your duty and take revenge for all those Greeks who suffered the same. That's what I want. 
Raise your glasses, long live free Greece, long live the allies. The second letter was written to his son. My dear child Costa, when you read these lines, my child, I will not be in life. I will have been executed by the Germans. My child, my little boy, I leave you orphan, two years old. I want to tell you that I loved you so much that I did not have the luck to make you happy and to play with you. When you are a man and you read the letter, you will remember your father and the advice that I will give you to you, my beloved child. I want you to love your godfather more than me because he took care of you. Listen and respect him as a father. Love your mother and your aunts. My son, never play cards and do not offend any woman. Be honest and a friend of the truth. Love your homeland and be a good Christian. Costa, my child, I am leaving you in good hands. They will love you and take care of you. I want you to forgive me for leaving you an orphan. My little boy, I will die with your name on my lips and sound lock live Greece. Zito Elas. I kiss you sweetly, my little man. Your father, Elias Canaris. Elias was executed on February 9, 24, 1943. He was only 32 years old. This letter conveyed the heroines of Greek resistance fighters in World War II. The story that follows conveys the brutality of the Nazi occupiers. Dionysus Gonatas lived on 40 Lakateon Street in Athens. He was from Kefalonia and worked as a lawyer. He had an 80% disability with both of his legs amputated. He was the president of the Association of Disabled People. He was arrested by the Germans when they expelled the disabled from the hospitals and there was a demonstration against the forced conscription. He was executed on November 27, 1943. He left a father and a younger sister with tuberculosis. During his execution, the Germans removed his wooden legs, threw him to the ground and sawed him. Before we continue to the third story, I would like to make a reference to an important place of historical located in the center of Athens near Panepistimiu Street. From 1941, the building belonged to the German army and the command under. After a comparative search of the list of names of Ioana Tatu and the list of names of this building, we discovered that the militant named Ioannis Kostadopoulos had probably been imprisoned there until his execution but we have not crossed it yet if is the same person. So let's continue to the third story and last story that I chose to present today shows the heroines not only of the Greek fighters, but also of some Greek priests. What follows is based on a 10 page report of Father Kostadinos Grigoropoulos dated on June 19, 1943. The Archdiocese asked Father Costadinos to visit the affair of prison in the evening of Friday. June 18, 1943, together with three more priests. They had been requested by the Germans to come and confess the prisoners who were going to be executed on the next day. The Germans had not informed the Archdiocese about how many prisoners were going to be executed. However, as for priests had been requested, the outsiders assumed that about 16 people were to be executed. The priests spent the night in the prison. Around 5 a.m. They, they were taken to the prisoners. The time available and the whole setting were not fit for a confession. In every cell, the priest was accompanied by a German officer and a translator. Father Costadinos wanted not only to let the prisoner confess before their death, but also to collect information about them, their families, and the reasons why they had been imprisoned. Discreetly, he was keeping some notes. The last prisoner that he visited that day was Costadinos Buras of Meligalas, Messinia, a lawyer and a former police officer living in Athens. Buras had a lot of confidential information to give to the priest, but it was not safe to do so. So the priest had an idea. When the prisoners were put in the little van that would take them to the place of the execution, he joined them in the van. The German officer that were with them did not speak Greek. Many of the prisoners, included Buras, started talking to Father Kostadinos and he was keeping notes. 
They told him about their resident activity and about their families. A priest in a van full of people about to be executed tried to preserve their stories, trying to give them courage, promising that archdiocese will take care of their families. At the same point, point they started seeking all together. When they arrived to the place of the execution, the priest accompanied them and he wrote, that was the most difficult moment in my whole life. I was trying to hold back my tears and with my teeth tightening, I was trying to give courage to my children until their last moments. Father Costadinos recording the last words of the fighters and their action as warriors as they were being transferred to the death squad. He stood by their side till the end. So I hope I was able to convey just a little of the weight of this historical topic. Through these stories, we saw the struggling heroes of the Greek fighters and we discovered the very important role of the church, both in helping the families of the executed and in the preservation of the memory of the Greek fighters. Thanks to the efforts of Archbishop Damaskinos and Joanna Chachu, the memory had been preserved and will not be forgotten. In conclusion, as Greek on history, we have digitized this book of Ioana Chachu and the names of the executed can now be found in Greek on history database. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Sofia. We would like to apologize for the tech issue we had with the PowerPoint. And I, uh, I already asked an apology from Sofia for interrupting her. Her presentation uh, is going to be edited. We will add the PowerPoint and it will be available on YouTube with her voice and the PowerPoint that she had prepared. Uh, we will now move to our last presentation for today uh, by Ioannis Michalakakos. Hi, Yanni. Hi, Gregory. How are you? I'm very well. Thank you for being here with us today. Uh, thank you for inviting me in that uh, conversation, in that uh, beautiful day. Uh, greetings from Greece, greetings from Piraeus. Uh, I'm, uh, I would like to tell me when you are ready to start. Yeah. Uh, I, will, I will briefly uh, introduce you and you can get started. Um, Ioannis Michalakakos was, was born in Athens in 1985 to a Maniot family. He holds a BA in House Economy and Ecology from Harokopio University, Athens, and a master's degree in Cultural Management from the Hellenic Open University. He studies the history of Mani and Laconia and has published various articles. He is an active member of the Greek genealogical community and has participated in major initiatives. Ioannis also administrates Maniatica a blog dedicated to manuscript history and genealogy. Yanni, you can uh, you can start. Uh, uh, Gregory, thank you very much uh, for the invitation. I have prepared uh, a small uh, PowerPoint um, that uh, during uh, my speech uh, I will try uh, to share with uh, people. Uh, wait a minute, please. Uh, can you see it? Yes. Uh, just open the, the full screen mode. That's right. Perfect. Okay. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Um, first of all, um, dear all, uh, I am happy you are here. Uh, I am going to talk about life of the average family in Greece in the first years in the first decades of 20th century uh, 
uh, in Greece. Uh, in order to understand what was happening in Greece, in what was happening in the average Greek family, uh, that era, we have to understand uh, the background, the historical background, a little bit of what was happening uh, in the area uh, the first years of 20th century, from 1900s till 1950s. Uh, the new Greek state, the modern Greek state that was born around 1830s with the Protocol of London after uh, the great powers of that time, France, Russia, and Great Britain agreed uh, to create, uh, was a very small country in the Mediterranean. This very small country in 1830s had two serious problems. The first, the first one, the first problem, the first main problem was that the uh, great populations, the, the main population of Greece um, was outside of the new state. Many Greeks were in Minor Asia, in Macedonia, in Epirus, in Thrace, in Thessaly, and in islands that were not part of the modern state. The other part, the other problem that uh, the Greek state, the new Greek state of 1830 had was that was limited in capabilities. Uh, the financial resources that had to handle were very few. And uh, after a decade of the first revolution was um, all damaged. So the first need that created was to expand. Uh, after so, after some years of uh, life, the new state uh, started uh, to have uh, thoughts of expansion. Uh, these thoughts uh, were prepared and uh, executed around 1896. In 1896, a war declared with Turkey. However, this war didn't have a very good result. We, we, Greece lost the war and had to pay, to, have to pay a great refund to the Turkish government. In the same era, in the same era, uh, we have the decline of uh, uh, demand of agricultural products from Europe. So uh, the first years of um, 20th century find Greece with a great economical and financial crisis, a crisis that was far uh, heavier, far greater than the crisis we had in 2010. Uh, it was uh, a basic crisis and uh, the state was not prepared to handle it. Uh, in fact, it was one of the main reasons that the first wave of the first immigrants in 1900s started to go abroad. The financial crisis that was based in agricultural demand from grapes especially and the lost war of 1897. Um, uh, in fact, 19, uh, the war of, of 1897 is not very well known. Uh, it holds very few uh, months, but it was a very catastrophic for the Greek economy. Uh, so we enter in 20th century with a big financial crisis. The other thing is that I, until 1950s, Greece didn't stop uh, to be in an unbalanced political situation. From 1912, we have the first Balkan War. In 1913, we have the second Balkan War against Bulgaria. In 1917, uh, we have participate, Greece participated in the, in the First World War. In 1922, Greece participated 
uh, in 1920s to till 1922, Greece participated in the expedition in Minor Asia. In 1940s, Greece participated in the war of uh, World War II. And in 1946 till 1950s, 1949, uh, Greece participated in the civil war. So we have almost 50 years on, of uh, constantly being in a war mode. Uh, a Greek family, it was very, very difficult to survive during um, this, um, this period of wars. However, this period of wars had a positive result to the Greek state. As we can see in the map I show you, uh, Greece expanded and from Peloponnesus and mainland of Stereia Elada, uh, adapted uh, in Thessaly. Thessaly was entered in Greek state around 1880s, in the end of 19th century. But after the Balkan Wars and the World War I, uh, we have Epirus, Macedonia, and Thrace. And under, around after the World War II, we have Dodecanisa, Rhodos, Castellorizo, Carpatho. So as we understand, uh, Greece, after many wars and uh, too much blood, uh, expanded. Greece growth and population growth. Here we have some photographs of uh, typical Greeks that participated uh, in the first um, uh, decades of uh, wars in uh, Greece. Uh, in the first photograph, we have soldiers of infantry 1912, 1913, uh, Balkan Wars. And um, in the right photograph, we have uh, a, an Evzon that uh, is with the official uniform. Uh, it's, it's, the, it's a uniform that uh, soldiers of Greece, uh, the elite infantry, uh, used till 1950s. Today, we use it only for the Presidential Guard. Here we have how uh, Greek population evolu evolutioned three, uh, through years from 1838 to till 1836. The first 100 years, we can say, of um, the modern state of free Greece. Uh, as we can see, 1838-1936, it's almost 10 times bigger. So we may have many wars, but the population and the geographical uh, place of Greece expanded. As we can see here and here, uh, it's almost four times bigger. And the population, as I told you, is 10 times bigger. Here, I also have uh, a list of the main cities uh, with population of the main cities of Greece from 1805, for example, in Athens, till 1907. Uh, the first years, the first en entrance of 20th century. Uh, Athens, for example, had 12,000 people before the Greek Revolution. And 100 years later, we have 168,000 people. So we see how cities uh, grew in the same time that uh, the country grew, but uh, also we can see how people left their villages and started due to safety 
and better and seeking better quality of life um, cities um, to, to seek houses in big cities. Also, we see uh, cities that they didn't, ex didn't exist like Piraeus. Piraeus during uh, Ottoman um, period was a very, very, very small city, very small city, sometimes not inhabited. Uh, and now uh, started growing. In 1907 has 74,000 people. Uh, we see uh, other places uh, like Idra, the island of Idra, that during uh, Ottoman period has 20,000, um, 28,000 people, now declining in population. This exchanging of population happens because now we have better quality, uh, better stability in the cities. It's not like the Ottoman period. Um, speaking about the agriculture family with this background, speaking about wars, speaking about how the Greek family uh, survived throughout, throughout these years, uh, we have to understand two main factors. The first one is that the majority of population uh, was staying, was living in small villages. Nowadays, 80% of Greek population lives in big cities. Nowadays, a, a big part of uh, population of Greek families live in, in big cities. But 100 years ago, the majority of, group, of Greek population was living in small villages, in provinces, sometimes even with villages with no roads, no roads that a, 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 a big um, uh, horse or two horses could enter. So uh, the main popula population was um, working in agriculture. We speak for people that were mostly farmers, fishermen, estate owners, shepherds, people who had to do uh, with nature. Uh, the other thing is that uh, we speak about an era that a very big percentage of Greek population had differences in the way of life depending where they live. Uh, in fact, uh, the people for, for, uh, from islands have totally different way of living and quality of life uh, in relation with the people that living in the mainland. Also, the people who lived in Macedonia or Thrace or Minor Asia had different impact from uh, other population that uh, had relations like Bulgarians, Albanians, Serbs. Uh, uh, and people from Peloponnesus, for example, didn't have this impact. So we have to understand that uh, people at that era didn't have common, um, uh, common uh, works or common um, habits. Here we have some photographs with uh, shepherds and uh, photographs from the way of living of people the first decades uh, of 20th century. In the left photograph, we see people in a, a man, a shepherd in Taigetos, with his flock. And in the right photograph, we see a small boy carrying uh, a black sheep on his shoulders. Uh, the boy lives in Mani, in Mani Peninsula, uh, in Peloponnesus. So we see that uh, uh, 
it's remarkable that even it is 1910, uh, the man in the photograph uh, wears the traditional clothing of the area. So we see that uh, even the first years of 20th century, people still had in used traditional practices, not only in the way of life, but also in fashion of that era. It is uh, remarkable that uh, people, even though they had very, uh, very big difficulties in their life, um, they still lived in uh, mountains uh, with great difficulties uh, and with lack of modern products. Um, here we have a photograph uh, of 1930s, 1930s, outside Thessaloniki. We have fishermen um, that uh, they stretch their nets in order to be ready uh, to the open sea. Uh, this procedure is ancient here in Greece. This procedure uh, mostly men uh, acted, uh, mostly men participated. Uh, this procedure, we can see it in all seaside places, not only in islands. As I told you, this photograph is outside Thessaloniki and people uh, try to use uh, their uh, abilities in order to have their own living. We must understand that back then, people consumed mostly what uh, they produced themselves. They didn't buy uh, easily uh, whatever they wanted. The main problem was that uh, market was not an easy thing. Why? Uh, because even money as uh, a material was not uh, very common in practice. Uh, in fact, many villages uh, exchange, used to exchange products like the ancient Greeks. Um, money only the employees had. The employees of urban, um, of urban life, of urban settlements. Um, of course, I accept the farmers, the fishermen, and people of the province. We have traditional elite that, st that still uh, had the power in their hand. These traditional elites were estate owners that were selling their products, the agricultural products uh, abroad, and were the businessmen of land. And also we had the ship owners that uh, had their own, they were owners of ships uh, and had, had they in their hands the transportation, the transportation means. Uh, in the first photographs, in the first photograph, we have people from Thessaly in 1907. And in the second photograph, we see a modern for that era, a modern uh, ship uh, that uses steam and not only sail. And that was a very modern uh, change for that era that led modern uh, ship owners to create more uh, fortune. Uh, in the same time, the first decades of 20th century, we have the start of the urban social class. Urban social class meaning that we have the first labors in factories, uh, we have the first industry, uh, and we have also employees in ports and small businesses. So we have the first urban class, 
uh, the first uh, class that started to starting to grow, we, uh, it is created mostly in Piraeus, Athens, Thessaloniki, Patra, and later in Heraklion of Crete. Uh, so we have the first classes that live from their jobs and not from land or from agricultural procedure. Uh, here in the first photograph, we have um, uh, ladies and men who work in the clothing in industry in Athens from 1907. And in the second photograph, uh, divers. We have divers and employees in port uh, of Alexandropoli in Thrace. So we can see uh, the first people uh, that live in services and not in agricultural life. You know, today in Greece, most of the income of the state and most of the people of Greece live uh, from uh, services, from department of services. Back then, over 80% lived from agricultural um, economy. So we have a great difference between uh, 1907 and 2007. The last hundred years changed a lot uh, the Greek economy. Uh, the other thing, the other thing in the same era is the start and the growing of the banking system in Greece. And we could say that we have, um, we can have a starting of modernizing uh, the services of Greece, like uh, tourism, transportation, banking. Um, something very uh, special and remarkable to say is uh, the fertility rate and the life expectancy. We have to understand that uh, now the modern state of Greece, after uh, 1980s, for example, uh, the family rate is very low. And concerning that a very big percentage of the young population is abroad, uh, it's, uh, the population of Greece is declining. But in the start of 20th century, the family rate, the fertility rate for every woman was very high, over five children. We see that the entrance of the century in 1901, uh, every woman had over five children. So, and that was common till as you can see, even in the next years and started to decline after 1920s. We have to understand that that was a result of the wars. People knew that back then the life expectancy was very low. So they had to have children in order the family to survive. Wars, sickness, low hygiene, no medicine in the villages, agricultural life. So people in order to, they were used that they needed people in order a family to survive. Also, we have to remember that uh, the first decades of 20th century in Greece, um, as we said, uh, the greater part of the population uh, were farmers and fishermen. So they, were, so they needed hands for labor. These hands were usually, uh, it was a common practice to be part of the family. Uh, so uh, they born many kids in order to help their fathers and their mothers in agricultural uh, jobs. 
Here in this uh, table, we can see uh, that after 50s, we have slowly the life expectancy um, to grow. Before that, before that, before 50s, the life expectancy was less than 60 years or 50 years old. For this reason, for example, Kolokotronis, who, who was 50 years when he entered in Greek Revolution, was told as Geros, the elder. Uh, here we have today, for example, 80 years old, the life expectancy. It's totally different that in the start of 20th century. Uh, something else that we have to say about the Greek family of the first decades is the position of woman. The position of woman uh, was very low uh, concerning what we can do today and the rights that a woman has today. Uh, the woman was considered to be um, a follower in the man's life and she had, she had to get married in order to have a, a success in her life. Uh, so uh, many women had to get married. It was something like obligation, obligation like an obligation. Um, the main, uh, we had a patriarch family in Greece until 1950s, uh, serious patriarch family. So they had to obey uh, the man of the family in the household. Uh, however, the first uh, movements, female movements, uh, started in the urban settlements of Greece uh, about how uh, a woman could uh, survive uh, because of uh, the money. The first women who were employees in businesses as uh, labor, as employees, uh, were the first women who could have their own wallet and their own life in their hands. However, as we said, uh, the majority of the population was, uh, was living in the villages. So they had traditional thoughts in their minds. In order a woman to get married, had to have prika. Prika is um, the English word of dowry. The dowry is something that was obligated uh, and uh, it was an unwritten law, something that had to have a woman in order to um, participate in the new household. A groom, in order um, to get married, had to provide a house. But what the woman could provide? So, uh, the majority of women had to provide money or livestock or uh, something valuable in order uh, to get married. Uh, dowries were something very important for the Greek family. It's an ancient custom. Uh, dowry was banned with law in 1983. So we understand that uh, it was very deep in mind and uh, in the soul of people back then, especially the first decades that lived in a traditional way of, live, of living. And uh, here we have two very characteristic photographs of uh, what a dowry and how important was for the new uh, married uh, couple. In the first photograph, in the left, we have ladies that 
the, the friends of the friends and relatives of um, the bride that was um, the seats, the blankets, the shirts, uh, and uh, other materials that the bride has in order to be prepared for the marriage, for, for the marriage. And in the second uh, photograph, we see the, the same woman carrying the goods, what kind of goods could be, as I said, not only materials, but also could be livestock and the richer brides could be land, olive, uh, olive trees, uh, grapes or other things uh, to the house of the groom. Uh, here we have to say uh, that um, the custom of Prika, of dowry, was so intense that sometimes was one of the factors, one of the reasons that people, especially the brothers who wanted first to marry to, to make their sisters marry, uh, go abroad in United States or even Australia to work in order to bring money back and make them ready to be married. It was a very sad procedure because many girls back then were very poor or were from uh, big families so they didn't have prika and they didn't have dowry. So it was very difficult to be married. Uh, we, sometimes uh, prika, the dowry, was so formal that had to be written in uh, contracts, the dowry contracts, that uh, were very detailed about what the bride is going to deliver to the groom. So we understand. Uh, so we understand uh, that. Um, uh, excuse me. So we understand that um, uh, this thing was very serious. Generally, in mind, we have that um, the the first decades of twentieth century is a battle between the old and the modern, the past and the future, the traditional and the modern. Here we have two photographs, one from Sparta in the right one, and one from Athens in the first decades of uh, 19th century, uh, of a 20th century, excuse me, 20th century, that we see people with traditional clothing uh, in Sparta and in uh, Athens. We see sheep in Athens, flock, a flock in Athens. Uh, here we have also photographs that show the traditional way even in 30s, 40s, 50s, and the modern, that uh, the modern way of creating clothing a singer machine that um, conquered every urban house uh, after 60s. So uh, we see the, the change between the old and the modern. Um, great role we have to say here is um, the, the electricity. After the electricity of 50s and 60s, we have great changes um, in the way of life. Here we have some photograph of Greek household in an urban place in the center of Athens. And in the left photograph, a Greek household uh, in 1907 in Messenia. Uh, as we can see, we, we see many people uh, living in a very small houses built with local materials and uh, living together even with their flocks, 
Usually, the houses had two floors. In the low floor, they had um, their products or their materials or the storage of um, their flocks. And in the first floor, they had their living room and uh, the bedrooms. Uh, here we see um, some, tell me, Gregory. You're muted, Greg. Keep going, Yanis. Ah, okay, okay. Yeah. Uh, give me five minutes, five minutes. All right. Thank you. Uh, here we see two photographs uh, of average houses, average households inside um, uh, traditional houses back then. Uh, people were living all together, so we are difficult uh, to have privacy or separated rooms. Um, here we have a traditional, in the left photograph, a traditional um, household and how they bake uh, oven in an oven, a traditional oven. And in the right photograph, we have a more urban uh, photograph from Castoria, a better and richer uh, household. Generally, we have to say that the first uh, decades, we have intense differences between the rich and the poor uh, households. Uh, differences that uh, today they are not so obvious in um, in the house, uh, inside the house. Um, here we have some photographs of how people, their, their storage food, liquid, and uh, materials in their houses. Stamnes, Vikes, Pitharia. Uh, here we have an oven that uh, can be used as a cabin in uh, outside the house, not inside the house. We have to say that also sewers and uh, toilets were not used inside the house the first decades of 20th century. We have new settlements due to tourism and due to stay stability after 50s and 40s. Here I have some photographs, photographs for the education of the average family. Uh, sometimes priests take the role of the teacher if a teacher were not available. Here we have two very nice photographs of the first decades of 20th century. Uh, and here we have the percentage, 25, was 25 uh, people that didn't, 25 percentage that didn't know how to read and write approximately 1930s. And uh, I will close with some superstitions that uh, they used in uh, villages. Uh, one is about the evil eye and the other about reading the coffee. I think there is no Greek that uh, has no knowledge of these uh, two type of traditions. Of course, these have to do with uh, the education level and uh, how people believe in superstitions. And I will close with this photograph that show us uh, Eos, in 1960s, a girl uh, from abroad and uh, a passage from a flock of sheep and show us how the traditional life started to have a battle with the modern life because nowadays in Neos you will not see such an icon. Uh, after 60s we have uh, the industry of tourism starting growing and uh, nowadays we have the services and transportation uh, more for income like uh, this period. Gregory, the speech to you. Thank you, Gianni. Uh, a great presentation, like always. People loved it. I see the comments in the chat on YouTube. I want to say that uh, uh, most of the most of the photographs uh, were not mine. Some of them are mine from my archive. 
but some of them are from friends and some of them from internet. If they want to ask where I found it or more details, they could transfer from, through you mm -hmm. uh, their questions. Okay. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. Everybody heard that. Uh, if you have any questions or uh, are wondering about Yanis's sources, uh, you can reach out to him. You can reach out to us and we'll reach out to him, whatever you prefer. Thank you, Yanni. Thank you. Thank you, Gregory. Thank you very much. Sorry if I was a little bit out of time. Don't worry. Don't worry. <laughs> good, good, good night. night.